the smoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Well, 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 well. Happy Monday to everybody. Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. How you doing? Back in the chair Monday. Feels like I've never left. Today is Monday, May 15th, 134 days into the new year. Just 231 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world. All across the United States. Hither and hither, to and fro. Back and forth, up and down. East and west, north and south. Far and near. This is Faith of Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet, I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? Yeah, man, the biggest week of the year starts today. Starts today. Think about it. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Okay, so tonight on the show, tonight, very special guest times two. Our doctors, J.J. and Desiree Hertog. Can you believe it? They are here tonight. And we're going to discuss their decades-long research into the true mysteries of us and our world. And we're going to focus on Giza, the Great Pyramid, what is going on out there, high technology. So we're going to talk about all of that. And then tomorrow night, right here on Fade to Black... Corey Good is going to join us. And it's a very special broadcast and conversation that we are going to have tomorrow night. And then Wednesday night, we're going to do Fader Night because Thursday night. No, let me back up. Wednesday night, Fader Night. And we're going to have some special guests do a drive by. We're going to open up the phone lines, our little pre contact in the desert show. Okay, so that'll be Wednesday night. How great is that? Thursday night. We are going to be hanging out with all of you. We're taking it off. We're going to be hanging out with all of you in Joshua Tree, California, at the Joshua Tree Saloon. There it is. I've announced it on the air. Joshua Tree Saloon. Go and find it. <laughs> and uh, if you've done it in years past, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a very cool place, and we're going to fill it full of fader night, fader knots like we do every single year. So that's Thursday night. Of course, Friday night, we will be at Contact in the Desert Broadcasting Live. Okay? And then that kicks off the whole weekend. So it just uh, it, the best week of the year starts tonight right here on the show with Drs. J.J. and Desiree Hertog. I can't believe it. Also, um, now let me get just a few things out of the way. We've got a lot to do tonight, lots to talk about. Uh, the Sandbox Twitter follows on Twitter at Jay Church Radio. Very simple. Um, everybody that is new here tonight uh, to the show, um, if you listen to uh, uh, Fade to Black or Contact or Contact or Coast to Coast, you know that Twitter is a big deal for us. All right. So if you're new to Twitter tonight, hashtag F2B, that's fade to black. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Tag us, hang out, get tweet deck, get a column going, whatever you have to do to, to jump in the conversation tonight with everybody. If you have any questions during the show, hashtag F2BQ 
is is where you do that and everything just stays live right here and it's interactive or you can go to one of our chat rooms either over at kgra or spreaker either chat room of both active and they're both live in front of me so any questions comments conversation jump in everything is cool and uh there's uh no um uh, uh riffraff going on any riffraff Fader Knots take care of that. They get run out. You can email throughout the show, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, so the breaking news, Peter LaVenda will be at Contact in the Desert, everybody. Yes, Jim Mars, our thoughts are with him. He's having some health issues, uh, and that's him, and that's personal, but uh, our thoughts are with Jim. He says hello to everybody. You know. He is the man, and he would be at contact if if he could. He cannot. So, Peter Lavenda, being the man that he is, he has stepped in to fill some very big shoes, and it's all good because it's Peter Lavenda, and, again, our thoughts are with Jim Mars. And I will try to uh, get Jim on the show Wednesday night to come in and say hello to everybody. But there's a... So there's the breaking news, and we did this right before. We announced it somewhat on Saturday night over at Coast to Coast when Peter was our guest, and it was that day that we started to work on this. Um, Rita, uh, with her assistance, uh, put put all of this together. We got it done, and it's it's now official. Peter Lavenda will be at uh, Contact in the Desert. Okay, so there you go. Let's kick off this show. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Of course, the show is live, and it's free. And it's syndicated all over the place, and there you go. Okay, so, you know, that's fine. But if you can't listen to the show live and you need a podcast or you need downloads, we understand that. So we have a podcast for you. All of the shows are archived. There are over 650 of them. Uh, And uh, whatever you need, Apple, Android, Kindle, whatever, uh, just go and download the apps at the iTunes or, or the Google Store. And then just subscribe. It's just two dollars a month. There, you can get your fix for Fade to Black. Now, if you want to become a Fade or not? That's simple. Go to our membership section on our website. It's four ways to do it. You can go from free all the way to full tilt boogie, the game changer, where you're going to get autographed hat and a T-shirt, and but you're going to get the bunker cam. You, you're going to get uh, downloadable, commercial-free archives that you can play anywhere, anytime. There you go. That's what that is set up for. This month, we're going to be giving away, uh, courtesy of uh, River Moon Coffee, uh, a complete coffee bar. Okay, so it's going to have all the hardware that you need and all of the coffee that you need to brew that perfect cup of Fade to Black blend. Okay, so that's what we're giving away this month. To get in on that giveaway, go to our membership area, get registered, or subscribe. Do whatever you want to do, okay? Your name goes in the hat. We draw. Something is going to be given away. Okay, there you go. That's uh, where I'm at there. Do check out all of our sponsors, everybody. That's how this show broadcasts. Life Change Tea. Get the tea.com. By the way, Ronnie McMullen. Uh, just uh, uh, sent me the new uh, oil of oregano. And, yes, it is indeed oil of oregano. I wonder if you can cook with it. It smells like you can. Who just posted this? Is that the Joshua Tree Saloon? That's it right there. That's going to get a retweet, Barrett. Well done. I didn't even know that was even on the net. There you go. All right. Joshua Tree Saloon. You know how many, uh, 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 that'll be this Thursday night, Um, you know how many Fader Knots have wandered in there and just met everybody else and was able to to see everybody and meet everybody that they've become friends with on this show over the years through the internet? It's, It's absolutely wonderful to see this go down. So there you go. Okay, all right. Where am I? Where am I? Somebody help me. Yes, this is Contact in the Desert Week. It is May 19th through the 22nd in Joshua Tree, California. Uh, there, uh, go for tickets and info. Uh, man, if you're this late into the game, good luck with hotels. But we'll see. Uh, the further out you go, you know, you might have to drive about 10 miles, but uh, you could probably uh, get an Airbnb or a hotel. Okay. Tickets and info are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Just click on the banner right there. 
Ah, yes, here we go. Now, uh, a couple of quick things uh, because I've got some other breaking news. All right, uh, on, on Friday, we're broadcasting live Fade to Black in the Lotus Room. There you go. We'll see everybody there. Um, Saturday night, I'll be hosting the Forbidden Archaeology uh, panel. Now, check this out. My my panelists are Graham Hancock, Robert Paval, Robert Schock, Andrew Collins, Brian Forrester, Carl Elberger, and just added our tonight's guest, the Hertox, are now on that panel. It doesn't get any better than that. That's at 7 p.m. under the stars in the amphitheater. Come and hang out. It's going to be 2,000 people for that panel. Come and check it out. Sunday night, I'm hosting the Disclosure Panel. All right? Now I've got Nick Pope, Senator Mike Gravel, uh, uh, Peter Lavenda filling in for Jim Mars, Linda Moulton Howe, Richard Dolan, Patty Greer, and Scott and Susan Ramsey. And that is also in the amphitheater at 7 p.m. under the stars. That's Sunday night. Each night there, there's going to be night vision. Uh, Stephen Greer is going to do his massive CE5 with probably 2,000 people. Meanwhile, night vision's going on uh, right down the road. So we've got Greer pulling him in and Melinda Leslie out at Orion's Lookout with them. With the night vision. Absolutely incredible. I'm going to talk more about this in just a second. And I want to remind everybody, uh, uh, all of the information is up now over at eseti.org. That's the next event that we're going to be at, which will be July 4th weekend. And it is the eSETI Science, Spirit, and World Transformation Conference. That's July 4th weekend. Head over to eSETI.org. We've got the links up, and uh, we'll be posting those out on Twitter in just a second. But all of the information is now up over at the eSETI website. All right? And then tomorrow night, we are going to announce another conference that we are going to do in August. Special announcement tomorrow night with Corey Good. All right, today I had a really, really cool conversation with Freeman and for his show. So be sure to check out his website, freemantv.com, for the best kept secret in conspiracy. And and check out over there when uh, this show was going to post. But I'm, I'm just going to let you know, it was a really cool conversation. I expect that out of Freeman, but man, we really let it all hang out today. It was, uh, it was an honor to be a guest on his show, freemantv.com. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Brian Eno is 69. Roxy Music. Remember that video more than this? Remember that? Brian Eno today is 69 years old. Also today, a guy that and that kind of steered part of my musical career in a lot of different ways for different reasons. Mike Oldfield today is 64, and he did the album Tubular Bells, which was the music of The Exorcist. Right. That album, that album, uh, Mike Barrett just said uh, kidney stones. Yeah, there you go. Well, my, Mike, I didn't want to announce. Don't make that public. Nobody needs to know, but I just said it. So there you go. Um, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells. And uh, I got that album in, from the library uh, down in, in Panama at uh, Fort Amador at the library. And I see it. I was like, wait a minute. And it said on the album, you know, Tubular Music from The Exorcist. I took that album home, put that thing on the turntable, threw on some headphones, and my life changed. That album was absolutely stunning. Mike Oldfield today is 64 years old. That guy was a game changer, no doubt about it. On this day in history, and it's a big one, it's a really big one. On May 15th, 1941... The jet-propelled Gloucester Whittle E-28-39. Jet-propelled aircraft flies successfully over Cranwell, England in the first test of an Allied aircraft using jet propulsion. Go look at images of the E-28, okay? This thing was about the size of a Ford Pinto with wings. Very special aircraft, and it looked like it was probably really fun to fly. 
and it happened on this day in 1941. Fader fact, on average, on average, most people have fewer friends than their friends have. Did you hear what I just said? On average, most people have fewer friends than their friends have. This is known as the friendship paradox. And that, my friends, is a fader fact. How does that work, right? All right. Tonight, very special guests are doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. And we're going to discuss their decades-long research into the true mysteries of us and our planet, uh, lost civilizations, lost history, high technology, what is really going on. And, you know, my favorite thing, right? We're going to focus on Giza and the Great Pyramid. But you know what that means. It can go in any direction, and it probably will. Tomorrow night, Corey Good right here. Hey, maybe we can get Mike Bearer on the show on Wednesday. You think Mike would do it? He's probably going to say he's hanging out with with all of his other, you know, famous friends. But maybe maybe we'll get Mike Bear in here before a contact in the desert because uh contact in the desert and and Mike Bear to me uh go together, right? It's like spaghetti and meatballs. All right. And so, Bear, if you're out there, let us know if you can uh, do a drive by on Wednesday night. That'd be a lot of fun to hang out with the Fader Knots. Thursday night, we're taking off because we will be in Joshua Tree hanging out with you at the Joshua Tree Saloon. With that, hmm. Hey, thank you, Bob. That's a good tweet right there. Follow us on Twitter at JChurch Radio. Man, yes, thank you, Norik. Man, you guys are good. See, that's, that's that, right. What, what I'm seeing right now, George Van Tassel, Teresa, well done. That's why I love this audience right there. Twitter, I mean, seriously, you guys are listening. You guys are engaged. You guys want to hang out and post and get involved. Thank you for this. I mean, seriously, this is perfect. I won't even pack my shorts. <laughs> Uh, Mike Barra, my man. This Thursday, we will arrive uh, once again in Joshua Tree, California, for the annual Contact in the Desert Conference. Unless you've been underneath a rock lately. Okay, I'll make the announcement now. Thursday, we'll be at Contact in the Desert. Now, soon after that, we're going to be up at East City for their for their gathering and both of these locations have over the years you know decades if not centuries of paranormal supernatural and et contact and sightings they are known for this now out of the entire planet the entire planet it's joshua tree and e city mount adams think about what i'm saying here And without going into specifics, and I don't have to, you have to wonder in advance that if and what will be seen in the sky at each event this year. And sure, I mean, I get it. That's what's on everybody's mind. And I understand that. But that is not what is most important. What is important is that if something happens witnessed once again by hundreds, if not thousands of people, is what will the media do? Think about it. Sure, I mean, the stories are going to break. Images, video, eyewitness accounts are going to make it onto social media and various websites throughout our community. But will it make it to the local and national media, the news? No, it won't. It probably won't. Unless something, you know, crashes and explodes. But it won't. The Phoenix Lights made it. And the reason why was because it was over a major city. But Joshua Tree or the forests of Oregon just don't matter to the media. It's not important enough. And the witnesses will be, you know, unfortunately, not the rest of the country or the world. It's just going to be us. Last year, after our contact in the desert sighting, I turned to Rita as we were walking away. We're we're walking down this dirt road, 
right after this, you know, we're still in, in a state of shock. And I asked her privately, nobody else around, just, just Rita and I, and I asked her, I said, if Anderson Cooper was here with us right now, tonight, and saw what we saw, do you think he would go on CNN and tell the world? And Rita, <laughs> one, one word, nope. And that's the truth. We all know it. It was at that moment that I realized that I had to say something. You know, so that everyone who witnessed what they did on that Saturday night had someone out there in the media who was willing to stand up for the truth. I'm not some celebrity. I'm not that. But I am in a position to comment on this on a mass scale. Potentially millions of people, right? And it was at that moment I just went, you know what? I've I've got I've got to I've got to say something. It was it was for me. It was one thing. Oh, man, don't take this the wrong way. But it's one thing to see something when you're alone. That's that's one thing because when you see something totally crazy and cool, but you're by yourself. At that point, it's just a story. That's all it is. No matter what happened to you or how you tell it, it's just a cool campfire tale. It's just just a story. But when you have that many people standing around you, you need to, if, if the media is not going to cover it, then somebody has to stand up for it. Somebody has to let all of them know that they matter, that what they've witnessed counts. They are going to go and tell somebody else's story. And they, you know what? You know what is cool for them? They can actually go back and say, hey, this dude on Coast to Coast was there. This dude who's got some podcast out there. This dude that's got some internet radio. He was there. And he spoke about it. And if you don't believe me, go and check out what he had to say. Think about that. When I was going to school for broadcasting, uh, we had various teachers and instructors from around the industry. And, you know, pretty much a little bit of everything. Local news, local newspapers, radio, sports, entertainment. And a couple of them, I, I don't want to give things away about who and what and who they were, but a couple were from CNN right here in Los Angeles. And all of the instructors that we had, it didn't matter who they were, they were all very good. And all of them were working professionals. And all I did, as you can imagine, was ask questions. And most of the time I'm asking technical stuff, you know, about lighting or sound or editing and writing, studio stuff, boards, the, you know, whatever, you know. Um, and that that was my thing. But one week, we were all assigned a, a, a local news segment that we had to produce. You know, we had to go on location. It's called a donut, you know, in the industry where you, you do this thing where they call it a donut because you're going to speak live in the middle. But it's, uh, believe it or not, I'm not making this up. So you have this edited piece that's front and back, but in the middle, that's going to cut away back to you and you're going to speak live in the camera. And then it cuts back and goes back to the thing. You, you see it every day on the news. So we had to go do that, you know, write video editing. And then we had to come up with ideas beforehand and present them and get them approved. So me being me, I asked this guy from CNN what would happen if he had a story about a UFO that he wanted to do and get it approved because that's what you have to you have to if you have something if you're not given a story and there's something you know to go and do and you want to do something you got to go to the news director tell them what you got you know give them everything can I do this and then it, hopefully they're going to say yes and you run off and do your story so I said what would happen if you had a UFO story that you wanted to do and you needed to get it approved and he said I wouldn't do it and I said you mean you wouldn't do the story? And he said, no, I wouldn't ask to do the story. And I was like, why? And he said, look, there are a few things we just don't cover. 
And one of them is UFOs. We just don't do it. We don't do it ever. And I said, what if, what if they asked you to cover the story on a UFO? And he said they wouldn't ever. It just doesn't happen. And I was, I was just taken away. And I wanted to drive this. I don't want you know to freak everybody. I don't want to get off, off task what we were doing in, in school. But I was serious about this. And I'm serious about the UFO issue. And he straight out said it ain't going to happen. They're not going to give it to me. I'm not going to ask for it. UFO, you don't bring it up. And I just tripped. I remember when ABC7 came over to do a story right over here at the bunker on the Malibu base. And I told the producer, they get me on the phone, they called, right? And they get me on the phone. And I told the producer over at ABC before they arrived that I would only speak to them if they took the story seriously and wouldn't crack any jokes. And the producer was like, you know, dude, man, this is a very serious and big story, man. Don't worry, man. It's all good, man. It's all good. So I, you know, uh, I made sure that everything I said during the interview from the bunker was straightforward. I covered the science and information and, and talked about reputations and that we needed to find out the truth. The interview itself lasted about 20 minutes and they got some good, strong material. I made sure of that. And I told the reporter beforehand and after I said, look, man, this is serious stuff. Please, please don't crack any jokes. Right. Well, what did they use? I gave them 20 minutes of material. They used 10 seconds of edited stuff, and they turned it into UFO crazy talk, right? The segment aired with the jokes and the theme from the X-Files, you know, and it really bummed me out. And that's the way the media treats us. So here we go with another contact in the desert. Guaranteed stuff in the sky. Guaranteed. And then e You know, there's going to be stuff. And we'll see and witness some of the coolest, most important stuff in the history of everything. But it's not going to make the local news. And it and it, if, is it because of Joshua Tree? No. It could be in New York City, and it wouldn't matter, at the home of Anderson Cooper. Think about it. And this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. The biggest week of the year starts tonight. And our guest tonight... Doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Oh man. Tomorrow night, Corey Good. Wednesday night, Fader Night. Thursday night, we're drinking with you. This is Fader Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back with Doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in, and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. 
Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA. The planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Mass- is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Very simple. And as announced, today is the first day of the biggest week of the year for us. I mean, seriously. And we never take our feet off the gas. We're always pushing forward. Just came off of a great weekend over a coast. Great weekend or great week last week on the show. But this week is contact in the desert. And tonight, obviously, we have two of the most important people to me that have been researching what we do here for decades. Very important to us. And and I'm talking about doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. And then tomorrow night, Corey Good is going to be here in advance of Contact in the Desert. He's just arrived in L.A., and Corey Good will join us tomorrow night. Wednesday night, we're going to have a fader night. Uh, it, it'll be open lines all night long. And I've got some very cool special friends that will be dropping by to hang out with all of you. So that'll be uh, Wednesday night. Thursday night, we, we arrive in Joshua Tree. And then Friday night, the festivities kick off and we'll be broadcasting live from Contact in the Desert. And then, of course, I'll be hosting panels and doing stuff all weekend long. And so there you go. It's going to be a great week. And we kick it off tonight. And uh, Drs. J.J. and Desiree Hurtock are founders of the Academy for Future Science. It's an international NGO that works to bring cooperation between science and consciousness to assist the various cultures of the world. Now, they have accomplished extensive archaeological studies in Egypt and were one of the principal discoverers in 1997 of the tomb of Osiris on the Giza Plateau. J.J. is the author of numerous books, including The Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, and we're going to talk about that tonight, Transformed All of Us. It has been translated into 17 languages, and The End of Suffering that he co-authored with physicist Russell Targ, also guest on this show. Together, the Hurtocks have written several books, including their latest, Over Self-Awakening. They have a new book that's getting ready to come out, we're going to talk about tonight, on Giza. The Hurtocks have also written several commentaries on the ancient Egyptian Coptic manuscripts of the Pisces Sophia and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Their recent book entitled My Dynamics is on remote viewing and is co-authored with physicist Elizabeth Rauscher. I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Doctors J.J. and Desiree Hurtock. Good evening, you two. How are you? Great. And we're so happy to be connected with you and your great work that goes throughout the the world and beyond. So we're all set to go tonight to cover A to Z, the uh, 
whole mystery of life that seems to be unfolding before her life at this time. Right. Does it, Ray? And, Jimmy, we're going to be on your panel, as you know, and it's going to be a great panel of Contact in the Desert talking about archaeological finds and what else is there that no one wants to talk about in archaeology? You know, uh, and and thank you f- uh, for joining that panel because now that you are there, it is the both of you. It is truly the who's who panel when it comes to archaeology and all of the things that we love to cover on this show. And it wouldn't be complete without you guys. So uh, thank you for uh, making the effort to make that happen. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. And let's take it from the top. I know you've had the opportunity to look at many of the um, the mysteries, the uh, the realization that we're going into a consciousness shift that begs the questions of who we really are, the origins of life, and the future that awaits us as we open our eyes to be more, so we say, embrace of a, of a holistic model of life. Right, and uh, Dr. Hertak is uh, doing a little bit of a footnote in one of the upcoming books of Robert Baval. It's not available yet. But uh, one of the things he's comparing is actually the Tesla magnifying tower with the Great Pyramid, because Robert thinks that the Pyramid Capstone was really very unique. And what we're saying in our latest book, which is called Giza's Industrial Complex, is the fact that water existed underneath the plateau. And this is we know from our own archaeological finds. But uh, Tesla, when he built his Tesla magnifying tower, insisted that water also mm, mm. Sorry, that water also be underneath the um, the magnifying tower for some sort of energy transformation that's right um, with with the two of you let me let me ask you this you've been uh, writing and researching you know it's hard to believe this is 2017 so when I say decades I, I mean that literally right? But here we are, I know, I know, I know, I know, but here we are in 2017, um, and the world is starting to step up and recognize, you know, research that you have done and others that you have been step to step with, uh, and your colleagues. But today we're starting to look now, the world just isn't what we have been told. Um, do you think that we are now finally at the brink of, uh, recognizing not only what Giza represents, but other cultures around the world, uh, high technology and everything else, but that just hasn't been recognized by um, Orthodox academia. I think we are opening the back door to the official history of the planet coming down from the scribes, the uh, culture historians, the so-called authorities of wisdom, and recognizing that there definitely is evidence of a previous cycle of intelligent uh, humanity on this planet. We're pushing the envelope into space and with new technology and with what we call remote sensing technology, airborne radar systems and very sophisticated laser systems. We're discovering that there are other pyramids in Egypt under the sands. Uh, I've noted at least 17 have been discovered in the last 10 years by remote sensing technology and uh, hundreds of of agriculture and and other sites of society along the Nile have been uncovered. So we're really at a major point of recognizing that a new history book is being put together as we talk tonight. Right, and so uh, one of the key things as well is the fact that uh, the video that we have on YouTube, which I think you said you saw, which is back in the 70s, the Japanese government got permission to be able to rebuild on the side, so to speak, a small pyramid, and they were going to go use primitive tools, everything that we've been always taught about how the Egyptians did it, and uh, they were going to ferry it down on these little old river boats and then, you know, put it up whichever way they can in some sort of ramp situation. Well, none of it worked, and it was so embarrassing that they actually had to take the entire thing apart, and we have that on our YouTube channel. But what's really interesting is that you really couldn't make, as we were talking about earlier, the little air vents are what we call star shafts that go some 235 feet long in the king's chamber, for example, that are like seven inches by five inches. I mean, this is something that's like amazing. It's one thing to put a block upon a block upon a block. Right. But when you start getting all the chambers that are inside and all the uniquenesses, I mean, even the king's coffer really does not fit well through what's called, you know, the little passageway from the grand gallery to the king's chamber. 
And when we went down to the tomb of Osiris, which we were the early discoverers of, there was sarcophagi down there as well that you could not have gotten down that shaft. So I, there's something else that's going on here. Yeah, impossible comes to mind, right? <laughs> let's just <laughs> let's just uh, uh, call it what it is. I mean, just nearly impossible. It, even with we would have so many problems with today's technology, like you pointed out with the Japanese. But any construction company, any engineering firm, if you went to them with a, a, a few billion dollars and said, build me, they would tell you, no, they couldn't do it. And that, that's really the bottom line here. Have you guys um, uh, ever gotten frustrated with trying to get this research out there, you know, rolling that rock uphill, so to speak? And, and fighting uh, the good fight. Definitely, and that's why we've held back for so many years to see if there's a right of passage or some type of political settlement in the Middle East that will give us an opportunity to breathe, to use sophisticated tools to go into deeper locations underneath the Giza Plateau that Desiree was referring to, where we were able to capture on film the Japanese efforts, which were short-lived and embarrassing, Back in the uh, the 1970s, 78, in that period of time, we were able to document, however, uh, things underneath the um, tomb of Osiris, uh, some of the waterways, and this will be published in a new book called Giza's Industrial Complex, which is work we did with another associate, Mr. Brown, James Brown, who was uh, a, a very interested uh, um contractor and who had the engineering skills to be with us. And so the long, long and short of the story is we're seeing uh, history uh, being compressed through the in, the information revolution that we've got now, microtechnology. We have tools that we didn't have 20, 30, 40 years ago when we began really to rewrite the history of Egypt as a model of human evolution, showing side by side the various strata of society and how ultimately higher consciousness comes into play with the Great Pyramid. Right, so let me describe to your audience a little bit about the Tomb of Osiris. First of all, there's the top layer, then there's a, you go about 70 feet down, and you find uh, another uh, little tomb area that has all these different sarcophagi and niches in there. And then you go another 30 feet down, so a total of 100 feet down, and you find a place that's full of water, uh, fortunately, when we went down there, and the reason we did go down there is because it was a very dry year and things had uh, the water had, level had dropped. But there's four pillars in the room, 100 feet down, and there's corners on each of the sides of the room. Now, why would anyone do that? I mean, Osiris, okay, god of the underworld, and that's why Zahi Hawass named it as such. We didn't name it. but uh, And there was a tomb there, but the water... There's water everywhere in all these pyramidal areas below. We went down to another pyramid called the Pyramid of Hawara, and it has water. It's right by this Yosef Canal. Right. So we feel that water, if you have water and you have sunlight, what we're starting to see now is that you can produce energy. I mean, people are starting to do this all over the planet because you can produce hydrogen gas, and if you use salt water and water, fresh water, together you can actually even produce uh, more oxidation of the water have you you've heard of Brown's gas or oxyhydrogen fuel? Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the points that I think uh, you guys are raising here, and it's important for everybody to to realize, is that for me, that the Great Pyramid um, doesn't have anything written on it, uh, exterior or interior, because it feels industrial. Right. It just looks like it was it was a tool. It was built for something. But the one thing it wasn't built for is to be a tomb. We can scratch that off the list. Right. And we need to figure out right. what was it that that this machine was built for. And you you're uh, you're uh, proposing here uh, uh, to to make gas. And what would that be for? Ultimately, in well, the end. I mean, they were able to decorate some of the uh, deep interior tombs, and as you know, in Dendera, they have that interesting uh, lintel on the wall that has it looks like a glass light bulb yes. that people look at, mm -hmm. and you know, they could have used it for a lot. Actually, one of the things we're proposing, because we were mentioning uh, part of our background, and we were just in 
Bulgaria last year at the Water Conference, which is really a cool thing. If which is the to... international conference with the top Russian, European, and American scientists in chemistry, electrochemistry, and the whole area of alternative energy. And it also centers a lot on health, but um, we've talked about the Brown's gas, and people are starting to realize that water, if you can energize it to a certain way, not only can you get power from it, and uh, trucks are using this in Canada now where they're adding uh, oxyhydrogen gas to their normal lines at the, almost at the end of the system, and they're getting better combustion. So that's one energy uh, area. But really, people are looking at structured water, even for health and maybe for agriculture, that could have been grown at the time. And so it would be like an elixir that could have been produced as well with the structured water. Let me you add- see this reflected in, in the hieroglyphs of unusual droplets of energy that look like water coming down around the person who was initiating a whole new type of chemistry. Right. So what we're saying in our technical paper is that, that fresh water production from seawater was possible. It was possible that the Egyptians used the saltwater batteries. They had a variety of energy sources were just coming across as depicted by massive underground passageways and waterways. And, you know, pyramid actually means parid mid, and that means fire in the middle. And if you look at the air shafts that we were talking about, we call them the star shafts, but uh, you actually will find them black. And we've shown in the book that a lot of areas, even the King's Coffer back in the 70s before they cleaned it, was also black. And if you go to some of the valley temples down by the Sphinx, the lower uh, columns are black. So perhaps there was some sort of energy technology that that affected the stone. Of course, this is really strong granite. But what's really interesting is, you know, everyone thinks of the Great Pyramid or the Three Pyramids in Giza, but you got Saqqara, you have Abu Sir, you have Abu Ghraib, you have literally t- probably 200 pyramids in the area even of just uh, uh, lower Egypt, and you also have them all near the Nile Canal, or the Nile Channel, I should say, the Nile River. So why would you build pyramids so close to the water? Well, I wanted to ask you this, um, and I know it's controversial for a lot of uh, people out there, but it's of my opinion that the Giza Plateau was inherited, that these were, I hate to call them secondhand right. or hand-me-down monuments or structures, but I think that that's a, a very likely scenario here. What's your position on that? I think you're onto something there. I translated years ago a Coptic text called Asclepius. This is one of the Coptic texts, along with others, that was found uh, after World War II in Egypt, written in the Coptic language. And it speaks of Egypt as the schoolhouse of the gods. And when knowledge was lost, the gods went back to heaven, and the land was, quote-unquote, full of corpses. Right, And, of course, most modern Egyptologists simply see it as a landscape for the collection of information, not connecting the dots, that there are are possible uh, examples of hydrodynamics, hydraulic energy, a whole range of things that uh, modern uh, writers like Chris Dunn has has suggested would suggest, uh, pardon the overuse of the word suggest, but would would argue for a higher realm of intelligence behind the modeling that is there. Now, I don't want to say that I I agree with people. It could have been a center of initiation. It could have been uh, many sacred ceremonies. I've been in the king's chamber and, like, seen the walls kind of disappear around me, and I'm out there in the stars because of the energy that's there. So there's a lot of power, and even if they were producing this uh, water and gas energy, and I would emphasize the water in terms of initiation, then you had people there in a ceremonial scenario. But what's interesting is that Osiris was known as a god who came and traveled around the planet teaching the ancient mysteries through music, and that's just part of his legend. So there's an acoustical physics connected with pyramids throughout the world. So in our work in the Far East, in Japan, in China, the Near East, in Egypt, uh, and also in Turkey, and also in, in the Americas, in Egypt and Guatemala, we've seen that there is a acoustical physics that enters into the uh, drama of why we are invited to come into the inner sanctums of these massive pyramidal forms that seem to shift us into a higher state of consciousness and creativity. In essence, we, we have four schools of thought. One, which is the official line that the pyramids were 
simple ritual cultural facilities built about 24, 25 centuries BC, a geographic position that advanced uh, civilizations from another region of the earth, came to ancient Egypt and built the Great Pyramid, a third, a temporal position or th school of thought, that the Great Pyramids took place several thousand years before the era of the, the pharaohs, and of course then the cosmic, which you and I are suggesting. We inherited these from a higher extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial life form. The uh, Then we have the other uh, aspects of this, and and again, when it comes to Baval or Hancock or, or Laird or John Anthony West or, or Shot, you know, the list goes on to researchers that have done extraordinary work. But then we uh, look at some of the celestial alignments and the possibility of this going way back in time. Um, everything is on the table here because we just don't know. There's no documentation of anything. Do you think it could push back 26,000 years, 28,000 years? Well, Dr. Trigger was also part of the Mystery of the Sphinx, which was the John Anthony West film with our friend Boris Said right. at the time. And I just want to give a plug also, of course, uh, uh, Robert Schock was a key figure in that, as well as John Anthony West. And we're all going to be on your panel, I believe. Can't uh, wait. Can't wait. Sa Saturday yep. night. And I also want to say, for those who really want more of just this, because, of course, Contact has a lot of aspects, uh, extraterrestrial and otherwise, but we're also going to be at something called Cosmic Origins in Sedona, Arizona, on the Memorial Day weekend. So anyone who wants to see Schock, Baval, ourselves, uh, I think uh, William Henry is going to be there. Uh, Clifford Mahoudi, who's a Zuni native, talking about that. Gary Osborne, who's talking about alignments as well with such star constellations as Orion. And so that if we can spend a few minutes on this, I want to say that one of the interesting things and in what we're going to be presenting at Cosmic Origins Conference in Sedona uh, at the Creative Life Center is the fact that the Great Pyramid, of course, has one of its star shafts pointing towards Orion on one side and Alpha Deconis on the other, which is uh, two literally different parts of the heavens. And then right underneath the Orion shaft is uh, a star shaft from the Queen's Chamber that points towards Sirius. Now, if you go to Mexico, you will find that in legends, and this is from um, an archaeologist, astro-archaeologist called Linda Shelley. She's now deceased. She says that the Mayans also revered Orion as kind of their father figure, and Osiris was supposed to be in Egypt connected with Orion. So I don't think any cosmology copied from one another. I think that there's a higher understanding behind all of this. But it's interesting that there are parallels between Egypt and the ancient Mayan teachings. So, what so we you, have, so we say, many different teachers coming from the Cosmic University to different points of Mother Earth at different times, but leaving behind the basic same blueprint of evolution. Right, right. Using which is, the pyramid, which is also a model of the carbon atom, which is a model of the human body, its structure, and also showing, as we have found through the acoustical patterns, that there are very unique levels of vibratory experience that take place. Even the human heartbeat we measured inside the great uh, uh, pyramid, the King's Coffer Chamber, and we found that the beats per minute of the human heartbeat are consistent with certain musical harmonics. So we did all this. We didn't publish it because the Egyptian authorities were against bringing musicology and, and uh, what we call the new physics of consciousness right. into uh, Egyptology. But now enough time has passed. The world is going into a, a major change, and we feel this knowledge will help us reunite humanity with a higher understanding that the, the Great Pyramid is a type of geophysical, astrophysical computer slash Bible for ancient civilization. So what you're suggesting here, it's very interesting. Instead of multiple paths of evolution that were running next to each other, that there was just one evolutionary path and one teacher above teaching all of these cultures, all of these important things with cosmology, math, and science, and so forth? I would say uh, that would be one archetypal pattern rather than one teacher, Right. meaning that there would be many teachers, and then the, the, the spread of knowledge, of course, uh, throughout the world would then 
represent itself in many different cultural traditions with their own bias, their own, their own theological overlays, but the, the essential blueprint is want of unity. Right, so Dr. Hertak had a unique experience in 1973, and that's what uh, brought about the Keys of Enoch. And what he was shown was the importance of Orion as well. And only later have we really found out that we exist in the Orion arm of our galaxy. But what he saw was that the actual constellation connected with the three stars in the belt, which is also referred to in the Mayans, is it's like a stargate, that it gets you out of this system into other dimensional systems. And I think that it's really just like a coding place, almost like we say the Bermuda Triangle or something, you know, will get you into other dimensions. Well, so will Orion. Do you think that, and we're going to head towards a break here in, in two minutes, so I'll get this question in. Do you think there is also the possibility that, uh, aside from a stargate, which is there, and I, I and I get that, but maybe that they are pointing to a point of origin that we need to focus on that area because that's where maybe somebody came from. Do you think that's a possibility? I would certainly agree with you. You're suggesting uh, the distance between Earth and some of the stars in the belt of Orion and the Orion Nebula is on the order of uh, 1,300 light years. I mean, to have that accuracy with star shafts that are so small going through uh, literally um, hundreds of feet of, of stoneware would suggest a whole architectural model that would only have to have its cosmic ramifications from a higher source, and all cultures of the world go into that source of Orion. Right, so it's not just, yeah, it doesn't mean that people don't, or entities don't live in the area of Orion, but if you think of Stargate, it's not just for traveling like us to get out or them to get in. I mean, it literally is a portal to other cosmic uh, realities. And so, you know, the higher realities that would be connected with Orion or Osiris would come through that portal. And so that's why it's so significant. And next to it and nearby, and this is understood also not only by the Egyptians, but specifically the Mayans, is the Pleiades. And according to Dr. Hertak's information, some of our whole genetic code is coded from the Pleiades. So I want to modify what I just said. It's, it's Orion and the Pleiades. It's not one particular constellation we're talking about. Right. And Desiree and I followed this picture of the two throughout world cultures over the last 45 years, and we find that it's, re it's a repeatable pattern, whether we're at the tip of Argentina or in the mountains of Ecuador or in the Middle East, in Sudan or Egypt, the Orion Pleiadian model is there on the star maps and the hieroglyphics and in the songs and in the mythology of the great traditions. And the Aztecs and the Mayans actually revered the Pleiades, and they felt if the certain alignment didn't take place every so often that the world would come to an end. I mean, that's how significant it was for them. Let me jump in right there. we got to take a break. Our guests tonight, Doctors J.J. and Desiree Hurtock. It's a long time coming, but they are here. Lots of conversation dead ahead. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Take a break right here. We'll be right back after this short message. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. Well, the <laughs> just... We are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? 
Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. I'm getting older and noticing that my body just doesn't work as well as it used to. So I like to keep fit as possible by hitting the gym a few times a week. Recently, I started having a nagging bicep pain and it got so bad I couldn't even lift the weights. When I was complaining about it to a friend, he told me about Angioprim. He said chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in veins and arteries that may cause blockages. You know, after just one week of taking Angioprim, the pain was gone and now I'm back in the gym full strength. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. So to learn more, go to angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or talk to a trained consultant. Call angioprim toll-free at 877-882-7221. You'll feel better with more energy. Call 877-882-7221 or go to the website angioprim.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back, Fade to Black. That's right. The biggest week of the year starts tonight. Contact in the Desert is later on this week. Our guests tonight, Doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Very excited to have them here. The conversation is going to be just that. So take out your pens and pencils, Kitty. The research is going to get a little thick. I wanted to ask uh, both of you this direct question, and hopefully I'm going to get a different answer out of uh, both of you. So, J.J., I'm going to throw this to you first. Why suppress the knowledge out of Giza? Why suppress this? Why choke this back? And why fight it? The logic of most uh, commentators of any major cultural tradition would argue that they have to safeguard that tradition from from new theories, from modernists, uh, from um, rogue Egyptologists like John Anthony West, others. Uh, we, however, would argue that humanity advances by progressive thinking and field research done by those who have merited uh, the hard work uh, knowledge, or should we say, the, discover the new knowledge by the hard facts of blood, sweat, and tears on the ground. And this is what we've done uh, behind the scenes very carefully with those who are geologists, uh, archaeologists, uh, culture historians, linguists, those who are working to connect the dots. And I, I mean that literally. Right. That if the pyramid represents not only uh, an amplification source, uh, one that uh, can be tuned to a certain frequency, a, a model of the carbon atom, et cetera, et cetera, and even a star gauge for uh, the various constellations we've talked about, then it, it's up to us to, to see a, a, a holistic blueprint here rather than a area of specialization that would be argued by the traditionalists. And if I can say that really uh, science advances and archaeology advances one coffin at a time, I think some of them... That's what Max Planck, the great German uh, physicist of the 19th century, said, because of the elitism that's built into academia, knowledge advances when one person dies who's at the top, who is really the guide or the spokesperson for that discipline. Well, you know, we've come a long ways. If you're starting to say, which we are as well, you know, that this goes back beyond 6,000 years, I mean, you're also 
you know, fly in the face of biblical understanding as well as that of the Islamic understanding. And so, you know, you're having to really shift the whole paradigm. And that's what people are starting to talk about now. And one of the reasons we were so excited also to come on and talk on your show is about the findings in San Diego uh, that we were uh, mentioning. And published in Nature magazine and also Science magazine, which is the mastodon bones that were configured by humans at a very early period of time. We're looking you know, they, at what they, time it does, right? Yeah, well, they found this, and just to say, they found this in 1992, so it's nothing new, and it only came out now. They wanted to have all their ducks in a row, and I'm sure everybody's going to put it down and say it's false and stuff like that. I mean, actually, it's been pretty well uh, documented that there were exactly mastodon bones found by State Route 54 in the area of San Diego, and they've been researched by Thomas DeMere and backed up by others from like the University of Michigan, Daniel Fisher, who say that the bones of these mastodons look like someone hit them and gouged them out, and it had to be, if not Homo sapiens sapiens like we are, some sort of hominid, maybe Neanderthal, beings that lived as far back as an average of 130,000 years ago in San Diego. Now, that is a big step. But it's, it's not a, any bigger than saying, you know, the Great Pyramid goes back 20,000 years either. So, Well, certainly, and that's 115,000 years before any suggestion of, of anything walking around North America. Exactly. But, you know, they're now looking at the fact that about 12,900 years ago, that maybe a comet hit up by the northeast part of Canada and wiped out a lot of things that were here because they do they found that there were horses and camels i mean can you imagine camels in the area of, of north america and those were all wiped out it's called the north american extinction and now they're matching very recently a south american extinction so it looked like there was a north american and south american extinction that wiped out like giant sloths and uh, many other animals there's a whole slew of list of them as well in fact, in 2002, a Russian scientist by the name of Yuri Boshanov lectured uh, the American Academy of Science on um, what we call Paleolithic tools that were discovered in the Siberian tundra, dating back 100,000 years. And he is suggesting evidence is also going back close to a million point two years before. So scientists equipped with new tools in all parts of the world are looking at the possibility that we're uncovering the evidence not only of a previous cycle of intelligent life, but uh, early proto-humanity going back over a million years, plus that uh, challenges the work of Marion Lewis Leakey in East Africa, suggesting that no, there were multiple places of human evolution, uh, of contact of some sort, where we see uh, actually tools, signs of linguistic knowledge or alphabets being put together, and records of uh, humans coexisting with the mammoths. Uh, so we're very excited looking at this world map, and it's reflected in my book, published in 1973, The Keys of Enoch, which is a really uh, a code book of how 12 different areas of the world will show that uh, proto-humanity did exist at an earlier stage of evolution. Let me... Well, let, well, just... well let, me, let me jump in. I want to address that, because I think it's very important... Uh, to focus on one thing, if um, w many alternate researchers have been speaking about this, there's a lot of evidence out there suggesting uh, things going back quite a long time, possibly millions of years. Do you think that the, you know, let's say the Smithsonian or other various government agencies quite directly know that things are out there to prove this, but they they can't and won't bring it forward. Do you think that they are actually suppressing uh, this information? I would say in an indirect way, uh, people in positions of intellectual and political power tend to get involved with their own personality and their own stream of thought to the point that they build a fence around their source of knowledge, excluding new thought or, shall we say, a progressive interpretation of a much larger picture or story of, of humanity on, on Mother Earth. But it's clear that powerful positions of authority 
have uh, really pushed back uh, areas of, of archaeological investigation, as we know from firsthand experiences in Mexico and Egypt. Well, the same person who did the film Mystery of the Sphinx, this is John Anthony's West, where they won a, I guess a... This is our, our friends, Bill Cody. Yeah. But they won an Emmy Award back in the 70s for Mystery with Shock and, and uh, Dr. Tech and John Anthony. But Bill also did another film, not as well known, about an area in Mexico called Valsequillo. And uh, there was a woman archaeologist uh, back in the 50s and 60s who actually said, hey, the evidence I'm finding is bringing people back, you know, or at least hominids back to the area of Mexico about 100,000 years ago. And she was, like, literally fired. I mean, she didn't get any money. She totally got dropped off the planet. If you look, I, I wanted to bring up, there's something called the Calico Hill site, which is interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's actually out by Barstow, which is not far from where Contacted in the Desert is. It's that area of the Mojave. It used to be a lake, actually, at one time. Right. And there was an early site as well where they've done a lot. It's about, I think, uh, 50 meters square or something like that. They've, they have found evidence of man there as well. And it could be as far as 500,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago. No one's really going to make a statement on where. But so South California, Southern California was, you know, inhabited, and whether it's Neanderthals. Now, Neanderthals, they date from 350,000 to about 30,000 years ago. And what's interesting, the new uh, genetic testing, on uh, one of the companies that's testing the DNA, is actually including uh, Neanderthal in your genes. So if you had Neanderthal connections in your genes, they'll actually tell you when you get your report that you're showing Neanderthal genes because they did interbreed with Homo sapiens sapiens. Very, very interesting. So it's, I think, you know, I know we're always interested in conspiracy, and yes, you know, especially people have been blocked from getting money to be able to pursue any of this or even coming out in credible papers. Uh, you, you know, you won't get this stuff until recently because there's so much coming out now. Uh, if I can jump to, uh, to uh, well, I'll jump to South America. There's a place called Pedro Ferrada, which uh, shows uh, writing on It's the, a Brazilian Stonehenge. Yeah, Brazilian. And they've actually now dated that at 50,000 years. And Monteverde, Chile, 50,000 years. Right. I mean, how does this even work? Well, we know it works because... We feel that they came across from Japan. Uh, actually, Robert Schock and Dr. Hurtaka will say slept together, shared a room together when they went to see the Yanaguni, the underwater monuments off the coast of Japan. Right. We were very pleased to do the underwater diving at that time, and we, we do have several films showing things that are incredible at six different locations. Underwater temples that were above sea level that suddenly were underneath the ocean because of cataclysmic change. But, you know, we know that in the myths and legends. And what we're saying to the audience tonight is just keep your head above water. Or if you can't learn to breathe underwater because great things ahead, I, I think a renaissance of science connected with consciousness and even spirituality in terms of a higher synthesis as a, at our doorstep we must persevere and connect the points. Right, and just down from the area of Yanaguni is an Isle of Flores, and Dr. Jack actually pinpointed this in 1973, and later on, that's exactly where they found the hobbits, which are called the Homo Florencia. In the year right. 2003. Yeah, right, and they right. go back about 100,000 years ago, and it's amazing. So I, I always say, you know, you talk about extraterrestrials out there in space of all different kinds. Like, How about interterrestrials? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, 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 right. You know, there's at least five different species that they know about. I mean, Neanderthals, Homo Florencius, now there's... A uh, home on the lady that came out of South Africa, where they probably buried their dead. I mean, uh, and they they go back two million years. So what we say, how do how do we put this all together? We say that there were um, what we call root races, and they weren't us. They weren't Adamic species. We probably landed here, like you know, and helped things like building the pyramids and got things organized. And there might have been some wipeouts, so we forgot you know when we came and how it worked out and all that stuff, but we think that we came from probably connected with Orion, the Pleiades, and several other star constellations around, and there were root races here that had been, you know, maybe certain intelligences had been playing with them to uh, evolve this planet. Well, so I've been... Said a mouthful there, 
And we want to look and ask our audience to be very patient and open-minded at these new areas of discovery, which means to take a vocation in anthropology or medical or research where you can you know, help uh, those areas of the world in need and do the research at the same time, because these things are very difficult to uh, document if you're not willing to spend two or three decades in those particular areas. Well, what's interesting, I'll say one last thing, and then I would love to hear uh, your comments, <laughs> Jimmy, but they've done recent uh, genetic studies on the aboriginals of Australia. We have very good friends that have like followed up on this research, and when they checked the genes, because we said there was a migration probably from the area of the Far East over to the Americas, even across the South Pacific, not just the North Pacific. And they checked also the genes of the indigenous peoples in South America, and they found the Shavanti, which is an Indian tribe we've actually personally worked with, having very close relationships to the aboriginals of Australia, who supposedly got there about 60,000 years ago. Well, I've been told that I have uh, Neanderthal on my face, so there you go. I mean, there's... Well, you, you should check it. I think, I, I think it was one, and I don't want to say anything because I might get it wrong, but my friend had Neanderthal in her gene test results that she got back. Um, the thrust is we're all interconnected. We, we have much more in common to be thankful for, and as we build bridges of understanding between the world cultures, looking at the, the greater cosmology of consciousness... We realize that you know we have new evidence that can unite us and overcome the old paradigms of the the hunting of uh, tribal mentality and recognize that you know we are being prepared for I think a great uh, step into a uh, new civilization not only on Mother Earth but in space and beyond. I wanted to ask you guys about uh, Scott Creighton's uh, book, The Great Pyramid Hoax which uh, I've had Scott on the show. I think the book is extraordinary. And he lays out a pretty good, solid case for this. And, it, and it's documented. And, and it, it, it's, it's theory that's been turned into fact, in my opinion. But if that is indeed the case, uh, again, which I suspect that it is, then the entire timeline and the entire theory and certainly even maybe even the king's list itself for for Egypt is in jeopardy and the egyptologist of the world and cairo has to step up and admit that things are are not correct on giza have you read his book i haven't read his book but this was something that even mark lerner mentioned to me years ago at the, when he gave a lecture at uc berkeley that the the king's list uh may have had to be take a second look and uh, look at certain inconsistencies. I had the opportunity to know two noted Egyptologists, one, the late Dr. Klaus Bayer, mm -hmm. B-A-E-R at the University of Chicago, and also uh, Otto Schaden at the University of Minnesota, where I got one of my doctorates. And uh, they, they feel things were much older uh, than the, the official classic chronology, which gets us back to the four different schools of what I would call uh, Egypt uh, slash Near Eastern culture history, that these things go back only to dynastic times and there's nothing in the pre-dynastic period. But we've seen evidences that there are, are should we say, the fingerprints, fingerprints of the Elohim, to borrow the terminology of Graham Hancock, right, right, the right. Uh, evidence of the architects who were here much earlier. The the other problem that I have that again it, it's a numbers game for me. You two, I, you know, I I just I look at the numbers and they just don't add up. And one of them is if we are looking at the official dogma out there that it was twenty six fifty B C twenty seven hundred B C uh, when the pyramid the Great Pyramid was built for Khufu and it's a twenty years and so forth. That back then there's quite simply wasn't a population to support the construction of not only the Great Pyramid, but the other 75, like you were saying, Desiree, 200. Uh, but uh, up to that point, there wasn't a population to support an infrastructure and the logistics to pull it off. They, they, it, it was an impossibility, and, and nobody wants to address that. They'll say it was done in 20 years, but they don't talk about how the population was there to support it, the infrastructure, the the agriculture, the, the quarrying, uh, everything else that goes into play. Right. These are arguments from sociologists and those in dealing with demographics, and certainly 
they make sense. We, uh, Desiree and I and our colleagues, are looking at electromechanical transduction inside the pyramids, the fact that we were the only group allowed to bring in sophisticated computers to look at the different musical uh, scales that are built into the various chambers, right. each reflecting a certain section of the human heart or the human body, suggesting that the pyramid with not four sides but eight sides, and you see this only with very sophisticated technology from an airplane, suggests that you know, it's a model of the human evolutionary code and that we are being prepared in the biblical sense of an exodus from Mother Earth into the cosmos of the heavens of the, the creators, the Elohim. We are being prepared for this as we bring together the information for a planetary initiation, regardless if it's the pyramids of Egypt, of the Guatemala, Mexico, Far East. All these cultures are ringing the bell, suggesting that we have to connect past, present, and future very carefully. Right, and whether you look at uh, India, real India out there in the east, when they talk about the Vimanas, uh, the flying vehicles, you also have a situation, as Dr. Ochak mentioned, uh, in the Mayan culture. So we believe that the pyramids were kind of, the technology was brought to this planet, probably even uh, created by an alien which is us probably more advanced at that time, uh, species that, that built the pyramid. And then um, the technology was completely forgotten, probably due to some sort of cataclysmic scenario that took place. And uh, we're just coming into the understanding once again. We feel like Alpha and Omega are coming together. That We often say that. The, the information that was there at the beginning of time has been pretty much lost. And now at the omega point, when we're making that next, we'll say, rendezvous with other levels of intelligence, we'll start understanding it. And I think that Robert Pavel is part of that. And I yeah. noticed that Scott uh, Creighton actually wrote a book with Gary Osborne, who will be with us at uh, Cosmic Origins as well. So Looking at reinterpretation of much of these uh, mythological norms, but uh, Robert Pavel and Robert Schock will be coming out with a new book on the, on the Sphinx. So that will be at that major event at the end of this month on uh, on the 30 20 yeah on memorial 8th, day weekend memorial day weekend uh, and i will use that as an opportunity to share some unbelievable film of what the japanese tried to do for those of you who are interested uh come to that event particularly the skeptics and we'll show you some incredible film showing that uh there's something more in terms of scientific sophistication behind the scenes. But I also want to say, you know, when you look at the pyramids, again, it's not just the three pyramids there. You have queen pyramids, you have causeways, and this is the interesting thing. All three of the pyramids have a long causeway that all go towards the Nile River, and then there's a ton of tombs around, and we're pointing this out. They're called mastaba, and some of these mastabas literally have holes in the top. Now, why would you ever make a tomb with a square hole cut from the top to the bottom? I mean, you know, unless they were used for something we really have not understood completely yet. So this is the big picture, to see not only just Giza, but to see the whole area along the Nile as representing the spinal system of the human body, which each of the major pyramidal complexes equivalent to what is called in biblical language the seven seals, or in the Eastern traditions of India, the seven chakras, or the energy wheels, the energy points of vibration. And if we connect all seven, the whole blueprint emerges as the temple of man and stone, the temple of humanity arising to the understanding of the story and the cycle that we ultimately go beyond and that is our Exodus experience, so to speak, our connection right. with the divine, the eternal one, the divine source. I wanted to ask you guys uh, uh, another important point that I think is ignored. When we look at uh, not only the Temple of uh, Osiris, uh, you know, you have a you have the you have the King's List right there, going back to uh, the first dynasty uh, with Mene, and when. We look at that, no matter what, there is no way to accurately date those years. We can go back to 400 B.C. to 600 B.C. with the Greek and Roman calendars. But beyond that, we don't know. There's, We just don't know. Is there the possibility that that King's List or the, the Dynasty 1 and Dynasty 0 Go back to 10,000 B.C., and we've just got everything wrong, and that the dating isn't at, at you know, 3,000 B.C. Uh, when Upper and Lower Egypt were 
um, I, I want to say the word allegedly, theoretically uh, joined. If you look at the Greek and the Latin sources, which I've done, you will see that the, the leading mathematicians and thinkers uh, from, each, from, from Italy and from uh, Greece went to Egypt for their studies, including Homer, and they refer to the time of the gods or the Golden Age, which would be approximately 36,000 to 30,000 B.C., approximately. And although historians will later interpret this according to certain uh, criteria they, they have, it's clear that these massive gargantuan temples that rise into the heavens, that point to distant constellations, that give us very sophisticated astrophysical uh, measurements, including the the golden uh, angle, the pi function, everything right. that we take for granted, suggest a higher mathematical uh, source of knowledge was bequeathed to the human intelligence at that time. And Egypt was really the schoolhouse, to quote Asclepius, the Greek source, the Coptic source of the gods, or the superior fraction of the human evolution. Uh, it's amazing, and we can't forget, of course, in Abydos that they have the uh, helicopter, the submarine, and the uh, airplane all positioned over the uh, first entrance lentil. And uh, we, we did research a little bit at uh, the Hawara Pyramid, and there's some ancient legends. There's a, a canal that goes between the Nile and Lake Morris, which is now called something more modern. And supposedly they had a king and queen pyramid there, that went like almost 100 feet underneath the ground and 100 feet above, I should say, under the water, because they were sitting in the middle of the lake. Right. And this is something we point out in our book. So they, they knew how to use the water, and they actually uh, you know, went far beyond the technology. I think most of the stuff, as people know, the, you said there was no writing inside the Great Pyramid. That's true, but supposedly some of the legends say on the casing stones – which are now completely lost, except you see a few in the middle pyramid. But uh, supposedly there was writing on those casing stones that was in a language that nobody uh, could decipher You know, when at the time. I mean, this was like Herodotus and those other people that had gone around. Right. So well, are we being taught now, to, to, as we find new evidences, and we're finding this beneath the sands close to the Harar Pyramid, that there is a an alphabet of learning, uh, so we'd say part of a a stellar language or a cosmic syntax that we must also pick up on. Is this part of our learning assignment as humans? And I would argue in the affirmative, yes, the time has come to put together a new global commons. Well, Turn on the light. Yes. Uh, with light in the middle, the, the pyramidal uh, word in the Greek, meaning, of course, light would be the electric chemical uh, feel of the human body being turned on, the human mind being turned on, to enter into the chamber of the deep and at the same time open up the astrophysical connections with the next level of evolution that we're moving into as we begin to pioneer new directions in space. Well, we need to take a break right here, so let's do that. And I'll say this, Desiree, on those casing stones, I can tell you what it didn't say. Khufu. That I can promise. Exactly. Our, guest, our guest tonight, doctors J.J. and Desiree Hurtock. This is Fade to Black. We'll be right back. Stay with us. here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk jimmy church with fade to black kgra radio.com end time is not what you thought in their new book, 122436, authors Mike and Cheryl Gilmore bring forth a startling new idea on the beginning of humankind, how life begins on Earth, and when our Creator concludes this age. In the book, 122436, three small groups of individuals, separated by thousands of miles, discover together the answers to the beginning of our universe and all the life it contains. Mike Gilmore is the author of five Levels of Power novels and the Sled Investigation series. Cheryl Gilmore is current state director 
director in South Carolina for MUFON and brings a lifetime of experience with UFOs and related fields. As a team, their new book about life in the near future on Earth sets aside most people's religious and scientific beliefs. Available exclusively on Amazon in softback for $8.99 or the ebook price for only $2.99. Remember, Amazon softback $8.99, ebook only $2.99. 12 24 36. Get your copy today. Hey there, quick question for you. Would you be okay with more energy, more endurance, thicker, healthier hair, a better mood, reduced appearance of wrinkles, improved sleep, improved blood pressure and cholesterol profiles, improved vision, improved memory? Okay then. Well, now, have you heard of Nature's Youth RSF? It's from the anti aging experts at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. See, at Nature's Youth, they understand exactly what it means to provide top quality health products. And Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain that peak performance and fight the aging process. If health, wellness, and nutrition are what you desire, choose Nature's Youth RSF. I did. You see, you're going to get older. It's just up to you how you feel when you get there. Get started today. Nature's Youth RSF. Simple to use, simple to order. Go to naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. That's right. Today is the day. It's the beginning of the most important week of the year. Our guest tonight, doctors JJ and Desiree Hertock. And and check this out, you guys. You had mentioned earlier uh, Shocks and Baval's new book, uh, The Origins of the Sphinx. I have got an advanced copy here that they've just sent me. I'm holding it up to the uh, cameras here in the studio so everybody can see it. And uh, signed by those two guys. It's an incredible book. And when you guys uh, do the panel with me, I'm actually going to give this away to somebody in the audience at a contact in the desert. So I'm holding it up right there. Hot off of the presses. I wanted to ask you guys. With the uh, the tomb of Osiris, and which wasn't supposed to be right, it simply wasn't supposed to be there. And you guys helped find it. Do you think there's another repository of knowledge underneath Giza, possibly uh, with the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, or or a library, and that knowledge that we have been looking for? You know, certainly Edgar Casey has talked about it. Do you think there's another discovery in there for you guys? Well, uh, again, the Memorial Weekend, uh, Robert Bevel and I will be talking about things underneath uh, Giza, including underneath the paw of the Sphinx, which is what we look with, looked at back in the 90s with remote uh, sensing tools. Clearly, there are many places uh, that are there, even what I hypothesize to be another Sphinx-like structure. Uh, we're just at the beginning of a whole new avalanche of underground documents uh, being uncovered at various locations throughout the Middle East, principally Egypt, but also extending to uh, Turkey and beyond. And uh, we're just uh, suggesting to the audience that we are fortunate to live in an age of the Internet where we can download whole libraries of information, and those who are interested may go to our website, keysofenoch.org, and look at some of the articles and books that we've posted. But I think well, almost like what you were saying, it's not going to be like they're going to be finding papyruses or something down there or even certain things etched on the walls. I think they're going to see the complex for what it really is. And I say complex because it's much more than just the pyramid. And where the tomb of Osiris is, it is in a unique position between the Sphinx 
the Great Pyramid and the Middle Pyramid. So it's in a unique place. But there's other, they called it before that the well shaft because there was so much water. And there's other well shafts around there. We're still trying to do more research on those. And, uh, of course, there's different small cavities they've already seen under the Sphinx. And we need to have more time to do. Dr. Hurtak actually also does remote uh, sensing, which is using technology to look what's underneath the ground. So you mentioned the, the buzzwords, emerald tablets, and that's, of course, from the 6th to the 8th century A.D. in the Arabic language. But there are certain precursors for the work or the legend of Toth, essential name for the scribe, or also called Tihuti, and sometimes even connected with the traditions, the mystical traditions in the Judeo-Christian, uh, as the Henoch or Enoch or Idris, a scribe of knowledge. If we looked across the oceans, both at the Atlantic and the Pacific, and have come across artifacts suggesting the, the legend of the sun god that reached America uh, on, on several levels of navigational uh, inscriptions, as the uh, the great navigators, the Phoenicians and others, pushed across the Atlantic, they brought with them the equivalent of um, finding positions of the sun, searching for wealth. Uh, they were able even to go into the Mississippi Delta, and we have evidence now that uh, there was smelting going on connected with e e Egyptian explorers. And so there were pre toth traditions in the West. Right, we're part of a small film that was called The Mayan Connection, and you know, it, here you got the same thing. You got the big pyramids, amazing pyramids going on there with observatories and everything like that, and they don't think that people could have gotten to Florida. I mean, come on, you can go from Cuba to Florida in a raft. I mean, everyone saw that in the 60s and 70s, and it's not that much further to go from the Mayan uh, area of the Yucatan to Cuba and then Cuba to Miami. So, you know, they, they did it. They went all the way up into uh, probably Georgia and maybe even up the Mississippi, and now we're finding this kind of blue powder that was traded between, uh, we'll say, South Mexico and the North American area. Uh, these people did much more, even in the Middle East, and even in the time of Jesus. I mean, there was a, a king about a thousand years before the time of Christ, uh, called Azahiras, and he ruled an empire from India to Ethiopia. You know how far that is? Yes, that's I mean, a long ways. Moved. They, they did a lot of stuff. They weren't just little people building, you know. So what we're saying is everything is up for grabs, and we have to use a very good measuring stick or metric at the same time. We need to work with people who can work as a team, uh, bringing together many viewpoints in geology, in the uh, astronomy and linguistics, et cetera, et cetera, because we have to see the big picture if this is going to show us uh, the navigational future. And what do you think about the connections uh, between Egypt and Australia? Well, we have found evidence on the bottom of um, the ocean off of Japan, the islands of Egyptian artifacts. Uh, this has not been published. And uh, we're talking to fair friends of ours who are working with the historic traditions of Australia. Uh, there are small pyramids uh, there on the eastern side of Australia. Right. In fact, I think it's called the Gumpy Pyramid, and we actually did a film with our friends there. It's a little bit up of Queensland. And uh, so they had, like, small pyramids in Australia, and they also had a type of stone uh, marker system, very much like Stonehenge, although little stones. And so did Na there's a – in southern Egypt is an area called Natha, and that goes back 8,000 years, and they found uh, it's obvious evidence because it's like stone circle uh, there with uh, even cows. Megalithic stones arranged. Oh, you're talking about an, an apt, an apt playa. Yeah, That's correct. It, yeah, an apt playa. That, okay, let me ask you about this for a second, because that stone, which is obviously a calendar, and is is pointing towards the equinox and and back then rain was very very important and not the playa was a lake by the way everybody 8000 BC but um but it's very important but th that stone circle has somehow managed to survive 10,000 years right it here we are 2017 and it is is still standing, but it is evidence of high technology and knowledge that really well, wasn't supposed to exist and predates uh, Stonehenge by another three or four thousand years. Exactly right. 
the, what's the bottom line on all of this? Because we're going around the planet very quickly. We're suggesting that reflections on life and intelligence on Mother Earth have been around for a long time. And this is the time of synthesis. This is the time where we point all of the points of cosmic origin and evolution together, recognizing that we have more things in common. And by the use of new scientific tools, a higher state of consciousness, a, a much more, shall we say, embrace of theology, cosmology, we are being uh, prepared, whether we recognize it directly or indirectly by the publishers of this book or that book, to see the, the collective raising of consciousness for a major change. And this is the impact that we will discuss at uh, Contact in the Desert, that we are being prepared for, shall we say, a uh, meeting with our cosmic cousins, and we must uh, humbly recognize there's a much deeper scientific message, even in our Bible, with uh, the House of Many Mansions as a uh, blueprint of the many worlds of right. the creation. And I, I want to emphasize that because, you know, you're always figuring out, well, maybe we were there 36,000 years ago, and so we were smart enough at that time to do it. I mean, we don't see it that limited. I mean, we think that there was direct contact with other planetary systems that were obviously more advanced. We were part of those advanced systems, actually, the Adamic species, and we feel you'll find us on other planets. You won't just find little green men or, or insectoids or all the other types. You'll also find Adamic species. And we came here, we built ourselves a colony, and uh, in a sense kind of gained control, got rid of the other guys, <laughs> and uh, you know, we just forgot who we were, and now it's coming back to us. What do you think about as we look at, and certainly the work of Lloyd Pye was, I, I, I just think, amazing. And I can't, uh, he's the one person that I didn't interview, right? I've, and I, I, I just, every day I, I just regret that. But that being said, what do you think about the, the DNA interference that may have happened uh, 150,000 years ago that certainly explains the missing link? Is that a possibility? I think there are other um arguments that could be made for Lloyd's work and others. We've, we've uh, worked with uh, anthropologists uh, in, in Brazil who come, have come across uh, skeletal features, larger heads um, uh, of, of a form of humanity or proto-humanity that like, was around. Like the Paracas culture? That by could have been the missing link. Yeah. So I think we need to be humbly aware that you know, there are other evidences out there that we're bringing together and, in, 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 in essence, creating a university without walls where we're being able to work with uh, specialists in all parts of the world now who, who will not be turned back out of fear or out of academic uh, ignorance and pride from looking at the, the fingerprints of a much larger evolutionary creation that we're part of. Right. We, we turn this whole thing around. I mean, we think, uh, you know, meteorites might have started some of the bacterial and plant life and primitive things that went on, you know, millions of years ago. But then after that, uh, we don't see evolution the way most people do. And certainly not localized on our planet because in the Keys we had pictures uh, from the pyramids on Mars in the Lazen Quadrangle that we were fortunate able to publish in 73, the first that brought back by the Mariner 9 uh, exploration of our sister planet. So the Zulu myths, those of Egypt and other societies speak of a war in the heavens. It could be that the end of the Bible that speaks of the war could be at the beginning of the Bible, which means that we're just a more recent page in updating both planetary history as well as the ciphers of spiritual philosophic interpretation of being, uh, shall we say, uh, cousins of other societies that also reached points of evolution, including the building of massive pyramid structures. Well, when we bring religion into this, and you're talking about our ET brothers coming coming back to us, and certainly uh, I agree that, it, well, I also want that to happen, but that is a possibility. Do you see, you're prepared for it. Our audience is, is waiting for this, but then we have the other uh, 7.4 billion people on this planet that just may freak out a little bit. Do you think that there is the possibility of a breakdown of religion and and quite possibly Earth Earth itself that it, it it may be just a little bit too upset and not ready for this? Well, this really goes back to the Keys of Enoch, Doctor Hertek's experience in 1973, where he was told uh, that 
all areas of science, and we're talking about even history, archaeology, which you could call a science, genetics, uh, also astro, uh, astronomy, physics. yeah, astrophysics and everything, will be advanced. I mean, all the information coming in now, you're saying, you know, yeah, it's being held back for sure, but still it's coming in, you know, by leaps and bounds as much as it can all over the place. That This is all preparing us because, yeah, 50 years ago, uh, we were not prepared, and I think most of the planet wasn't prepared. And now I think most of the planet is. I mean, we travel, you know, look at Mexico. I mean, they're totally prepared. I mean, they see UFOs all the time. But you go to Africa, they see it. We go to South America, to the primitive peoples there, they see it. Most of Brazil all accepts UFOs uh, as realities. I mean, they've been, they appeared in the skies over uh, Peru in, in the broad daylight, and they stood there long enough for a film crew to go out there, and people are going, I don't believe in this, but look what's up there. You know, I mean, you can so see that. So, Desiree's using this word primitive uh, in quotation marks. In other words, they may be primitive in terms of industrial norms, but certainly even more advanced in terms of inner psychology and development. So what we're saying is, in our, in our work, we're realizing that there's a human side and the divine spark within us, and that, that uh, man-god partnership or woman-god partnership, that is to say the higher self that is part of the evolutionary movement beneath the order of the genetic code is what keeps us going, and we're rediscovering the divine part of the human nature. And we're definitely prepared. I think people all over the world are being prepared. Of course, you always have a few that are going to be shocked, but that's because they're the dinosaurs, you know. <laughs> Well, and I want to go back to, uh, I want to back up just a little bit and go back to Yonaguni because I, I, what my eyes, I believe my eyes, right? That's, I trust my eyes. That looks about as man-made and as artificial as the car in my driveway, right? That is, that is not, the car in my driveway is not natural. It wasn't created by Gaia. But uh, the same thing with Yonaguni, but there's other researchers out there, shock being one, saying, no, it is 100% natural. What, when you guys first saw it, uh, what went through your mind and what kind of impact did it have on you? The first experience I had was, this, was the evidence of an Egypt of the Far East underwater, that the story of, of, of Giza was all over the planet. It wasn't localized in Egypt. There was a Giza or a, a temple terminal structure uh, in the Far East in Japan. There was one at the tip of South America. There was a, one that would be found in uh, the waste areas of northern Canada. There would be one that would be found in the Pacific. In other words, uh, the whole idea of, of Giza was before my eyes underwater, and it was a tremendous sense to, to see the the artistic embellishments and just the ingenuity that was there. And although many at the time thought that this was the result of ocean dynamics, the splitting of rock forms and the misreading of information, we found at six different locations with underwater cameras that there were large uh, pieces of stoneware that were uniquely balanced and structured side by side in near perfect elevation suggesting a human uh, architect, geologist, civil engineer, civil engineer had to work side by side. Right, so it's not just the castle as they call it, but there's actually others, there's a place called the stage and there was uh, actually a big boulder on top of a like, raised bed and there's even a whole camp. You can see this in our film called The Temple of Mu, which is available on our website. It was put together by Japanese explorers and anthropologists, uh, we were uh, scientific advisors. It came out in the late 1990s, but it's still available, and it's one of several uh, very important educational tools we need to see the connection. And it talks about, at the end, how a similarity could have been that people... Well, look, we're seeing it today. I mean, Florida, my sister actually has to drive seven blocks to get to her coastal apartment you know i mean water levels are rising and if you you know wait another hundred years i mean it florida might start looking like that as well so i mean these things happen and uh, that might have been the cause for many of the people uh going to uh the americas but on the other hand the theory is that if the water level is much lower it was actually easy to go from australia 
all the way across to Tahiti, to Easter Island, and to the New World, because, it, it, you know... It was called by anthropologists uh, island hopping from one side of the planet to the other. I mean, even the aboriginals going to Australia, where now they would have to take a, uh, a larger boat back in those days, they even admit that the water levels were much lower, and probably even a little canoe would have done it. And they so might have walked. A new textbook, a new textbook on evolution. Right, right, right. Yeah, the aborigin they, they they may have walked to Australia if you think about that. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I want to talk about Easter Island for a second. Be, uh, it, it, Easter Island is important for a lot of different reasons. One, we have the same movement of megalithic uh, uh, stones that nearly seem impossible, if not completely impossible, to do. But I think what's even more important than that, as crazy as it sounds is how did they get there? Because uh, canoeing 2,000 miles in a canoe just sounds impossible to me. That's the first issue I have. And second, the writing on the uh, on the statues there uh, resembles, uh, nobody can read it, but it certainly resembles writing uh, ancient scripts out of Pakistan. And that's, that's 10,000, 11,000 miles away. Um, Easter Island is 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 hard to explain, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so, right. Uh, what the what you're referring to is also the position of the hands on the lower part of the statues holding the large heads. Right. Those hands are in positions of mudras, or which is uh, a sign of um, of geometric instruction according to the Sanskrit cultures. So there's a very interesting story here yet to be told. We were able to uh, look at the statues in terms of music and acoustics for several of the statues were were uh, hollow, and we were able to uh, understand that they were there for something greater than just Japanese or American tourists. Right, and so we were there actually with our friend Boris Ed, who is the one who uh, was with John Anthony West on Mystery of the Sphinx. And, uh, you know, people said, oh, they, we didn't realize they had hands and feet, but they actually do. Most of them are just so old that they've been covered up. Right. So you only have seen the top part. Years ago, when you used to go to the Sphinx, and my father actually was there only at, the, the, like, 1924, you only saw the very top part of the Sphinx. You didn't see the paws because they were all covered underneath, and that wasn't, you know, probably as long ago as some of the Southern stuff. But uh, anyways, uh, they're amazing statues, and of course they have the bird culture, the bird man culture, and I think that that's really where more of the writing is. But uh, yeah, no, it's very clear if you look at the artifacts of the Pacific area, especially from Yanaguni, but also there's others in some of the islands, and then you look at some of the, like, structures around Peru and uh, Bolivia, you find a commonality in even the construction, and that's what Temple of Mu is also trying to point out, that there, clearly it was, it's the same culture, so to speak, that came across. Has anybody... So we're discovering... Well, uh, has anybody done... Any, oh, I'm sorry, uh, JJ. I just want to ask you really quick before we uh, move forward. Has, has there been any DNA testing on the Rapa Nui? I'm sure there has been. But, you know, I don't think anyone would really put um, most of those people as being, it's now, of course, owned by Chile. And I'm not sure if any of those people, even the aboriginals now, it's very hard to find a pure aboriginal person. They, they, so. they uh, uh, Unfortunately, the original inhabitants were victims of starvation because cutting down the logs in the forest, deforestation, we were told they reduced their food sources. And so the original uh, inhabitants that may have been behind these um, the gargantuan statues, of course, I have long since disappeared. Nonetheless, the quest continues, and this is, again, the exciting part of our conversation together. We encourage people to be aware that we are uh, in an organization that uh, wishes to encourage young anthropologists, educators, philosophers, even physicists, to take a second look at the human blueprint of evolution and recognize that we are connected to what we believe is a higher evolution and that we're being prepared for a quantum change and a connection with the positive forces of divine intelligence, not the playful gods of destruction or those that have, shall we say, mimicked history in the wrong fashion. But we had given the privilege of putting the pieces together, the scientific as well as the philosophical, spiritual. And this is really a great blessing for we here in Western uh, uh, civilization.
I wanted to ask you as we head into a break, I've never heard you guys talk about this. Have you ever seen anything strange in the sky? Certainly, we've documented this. Um, uh, we've not only seen things in the sky, but we've seen uh, what we call flashes of light, uh, what um, oh, Jose Escamilla calls rod-like uh, forms of geometric uh, uh, light projections that defy you know, our scientific uh, understandings of the present. Right. We call them light ships in general. Yes, of course. That, that kind of brought us together back in the early days. And, and sh- shortly after Dr. Hertak's unique experience, actually, there were quite a few that not only I, but many of his other students, I was a student at the time for him, he was teaching in Southern California, uh, also saw. Uh, so this would move the conversation into the realm of astrophysics, cosmology, and the beyond, where we see that we are, in essence, a cosmic, planetary, anthropo-ecological being on many levels of intelligence. And as you probably know that we're going to be doing the Integraton, we did it last year at Contact in the Desert. It's all sold out, so I'm not trying to advertise it. But because we're one of the few people that knew, uh, the late George Van Tassel. Yes, uh, Doctor used to take his students there on a Sunday afternoon to talk to him and his wife, and we got to go under giant rock. And, and who proposed a theory of vibration behind the the acceleration of the he, power of the mind? He also had contact and used to do in the fifties and sixties what we're doing this coming he, weekend at Contact he, in the Desert. He was so ahead of his game. I, I speak about George all the time on the show. I have gone back, just so you two know, I've gone back and listened to all of his rotary lectures that he did in the 50s, right? I've listened to all of his presentations. That guy freaks me out. George Van Tassel was um, an unbelievable person. And we're going to hit a break here in just a second. But tell me, what was he like? George Van Tassel... I feel was one of the most equipped engineers to describe the authentic history of of modern uh, man on the western side of this planet. He was looking at technology not only for UFOs and getting us off the planet, but also for health and healing. I thought that was a great combination. Yeah, and and he the- understood this so uniquely that the U.S. Navy had to post a sentry to watch his movements. Yeah. And, uh, Forbid his economics, so to speak. Yeah, he talks about in this, uh, it's a rare piece of video, but he talks about, and I haven't been able to find it. And and Like I said, we're going to hit a break here in 60 seconds. We can talk about this when we come back. But he talks about this time machine that he built in Santa Monica. Forget about Giant Rock and the Integratron. But he talks about this building that he had in Santa Monica where he was able to record um events six years prior that are in the atmosphere right and it's it's one of the most <laughs> he was just george van tassel was the man and uh just an incredible incredible guy and you're absolutely right where contact in the desert is happening van tassel was doing this 50 years ago it's a he was a pretty uh incredible gentleman Contact in the desert should take his hat off to George Fantastic. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. That area on the map of the world. Yeah, no question about it. Let's take a break right here. Our guest tonight, the Hertax Doctors, JJ and Desiree. More with them, and a great conversation will continue right after this short break. Stay with us. The Metal Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. 
and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio. A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. My name's Doug Salamone, and I have a new show for you that will blow your mind. So what kind of show is it? It's a podcast, and it's called In the News. And you can find us at inthenewspodcast.com. We talk about what's new, what's crazy, what's out of this world, and we'll dissect those thoughts, ideas, and events right here on the show. And hear all the news you may have missed or really don't give a crap about but want to hear anyways. So come on over and meet me at inthenewspodcast.com. That's in the newspodcast.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605 562 4482? No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605 562 4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back, Fade to Black. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Very simple. This portion of the broadcast is brought to you by Life Change Tea. Just click on the banners over at jimmychurchradio.com. It'll take you to getthetea.com. Help yourself, help the show, change your life, getthetea.com. Just use the promo code Jimmy when you order, either online, over the phone, and because you know somebody, me, you're going to get yourself some free shipping. Our guest tonight, the Hurtox, doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtox are with us. I wanted to ask you guys uh, something pretty direct, which is this. We have uh, a few generations of of us that are part of our community, but we also have the generation that is coming up, uh, you know, the youngsters out there that are listening to this show, too, as well. How do they get started, and and what would you suggest to them uh, to start to open up their mind and, and get started through this world that we are part of? Well, you know, I'm actually shocked because you talk to some of these young people, and they think it's all on television. They think it's all sci-fi. They don't see it as real, and I, I think that's really sad. I mean, we were interested in this stuff, at least when I was growing up, and so that you need to start thinking outside the box, and we really tr- turn the tree of life upside down. We don't think that everything evolved here from one type of uh, branch. You said missing link. I kind of like just didn't even answer that because we don't think there's a missing link. We think the missing link is the fact of coming from other planetary systems to here. It's kind of like terraforming the planet. And, you know, I don't care. At least they should understand what we're looking for and possibly going to Mars and other planets. We would go there if we could and fix the um, the magnetic field to hold or find planets that would hold an atmosphere. We would do some primitive planting, like maybe even with meteorites hitting the planet, 
uh, building... Um, or put, shipping in mollus- mollusk or other biological life forms. So basically terraform. And then later on, once the planet got ripe a million years later or whatever, you know, then we would start putting advanced life, of even like zebras and cats and different types of forms of animals on there. And eventually, when it got to a certain point, you know, probably go there to live ourselves. And I think that's really how it all happened. And I know it sounds far out for most people, but that's really, I think, what we're going to be finding. In the, and that's the real shock, I think. I think people need to see that science is uh, great uh, territory and that one should not be afraid of knowledge. We're really at the lip of uncovering just the tip of an iceberg, you might say, the pyramidal capstone that's within our own mind and realizing that that structure in Egypt we talked about tonight is pointing to vast libraries of information not only there in Egypt under the sands, but also it's it's also a a gauge for time capsules of information throughout the world. Right, and you were talking about George Van Tassel, whom we knew, and uh, you know, not so familiar with what he was doing in Santa Monica. But you mentioned Russell Targ was on your show, and of course, what was cool with Russell. Uh, who's a very good friend of ours, is that he did a whole thing with the silver market. Are you familiar with that? Where yep. they were advancing every week to see if the remote viewers, these are people who could see into the future literally, would uh, get the silver as silver or, or whatever stock they were working on as going up or going down. And they literally made something like $50,000 with this. And another similar study was done at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and here, you know, you'd have five or ten people, and they'd all give their opinion. You'd take the average. I don't think uh, Russell had quite as many. But, you know, they, you can predict the future. So what does that mean? I, for, for young people, I think we have to realize that science is really taking a quantum leap. We tell them to get involved in science. And raise their consciousness and realize the power of the mind, the power of higher consciousness, out of which matter as well as mental energy proceed. And that's why we're so excited about our new book with our co-author, Elizabeth Rauscher, a leading female mathematician worldwide, who has put together with our help and other uh, scholars over 40 years of research at Stanford Research Institute with the best scientists in the United States who looked critically at the power of the mind to reach out around the world, retrieve knowledge, go underneath the ground, go into space, uh, and realize without technology necessary the mind can span great distances. And so we have great powers of the mind we don't explore because of the culture of violence and death that young people are subject to. And so we have to get young people to break the electronic seance with uh, misinformation, particularly the, the culture of violence on television. But that's what we can do. I mean, we can use the power of the mind to see around the world, to see what's going on, to visualize it. You don't have to be an advanced remote viewer like Ingo Swan or Pat Price. Or, people can do this all the time. I say look at your own cell phones and determine who's calling you before you actually physically look at it, and you'll start advancing your own remote viewing possibilities. But... ETs do the same thing, and that's part of our own evolutionary culture that we're being exposed to. ETs don't talk. They actually project thoughts, and they can pick up on your thoughts. So this is all part of what's, you know, really our evolution, our next phase, and who we are. We, and I think kids are doing it in naturally. Uh, Dr. Tech said when he was on the other side, he saw mostly pictographs and, and visual things, not so much language. Language is used for sound, tone, vibrations, but not necessarily to convey data like we use uh, language today. And, um, you know, basically ETs do the same thing. What do you think about the influence of Hollywood on this younger generation? Because we it, we kind of get uh, a couple of things that are cool, but we get a negative side. The cool side is that generation completely accepts the presence of E.T. and that we are not alone in the universe. That is a no-duh situation. They accept that. But Hollywood says that we're up for a big fight and that this is also evil, right? We get both. And why, why do you think Hollywood is projecting this negative ET aspect? I think a large part of the management in Hollywood, particularly those in charge of the money machine, want to keep our, our, our anxiety and our angst at the forefront because there is, uh, shall we say, advantages to putting... Um, a part of society in in imbalance and in fear, and yeah. in fear, and that's been the overriding paradigm within all of the major paradigms. As we live in fear, we live in fear of the 
power of the mind, the power of the divine mind, the power of the greater universe that we're part of, and to cross the cosmic void uh, requires great courage. And I think this would be another part of our new education formula, you know, a, a university of the future where we can see that there's a positive future we can construct if we can use more of the power of the mind and the higher states of creativity. Right, and we feel what's out there is pretty much like what's down here. I mean, you have the really good guys that you want to hang out with. You have those people you don't really want to hang out with at all. But, you know, with that said, uh, you know, we'd be dead if they really wanted us dead. So uh, basically, you know, there's a lot who really want us to wake up, uh, go out into space, be part of their own culture, and really, for the most part, put away our weapons of war. And they certainly don't like nuclear uh, technology at all. That's been very clear. Yeah, very so, clear. In that sense, we have to have a new biological textbook also showing the different forms of the E team, what we call the ultra terrestrials, far beyond the physical forms of intelligence that are maybe a thousand years or several thousand years more advanced than us in terms of the technological curve, who are more on the spiritual side of the higher realm of intelligent life that look more to the creative, the musical, the intuitive. All of these gifts that the great mystics, the great philosophers speak of that are necessary to balance society. Otherwise, we go down through another cycle of nemesis, to self-preoccupation uh, with weapons and power systems, and that's the end of that level of the game. I wanted to ask you, uh, before uh, we close out tonight, there's two subjects I, I want to uh, uh, get from you. First is this. We have uh, ancient Sumer, Mesopotamia, Egypt, 3000 B.C. That is, that is what we have been fed. That is the narrative. That's the start of everything. But here we have Gobekli Tepe, right there in Turkey on the border between Syria, and it uh, it's five to seven thousand years predating anything else that uh, academia wants to tell us is the start of everything. Gobekli Tepe You're was right. Yes, we were there. We were at the very foundations of Gobekli Tepe, going back even maybe some suggest even fifteen to twenty thousand before present. Right, showing a unique strata of information that was sequestered in certain uh, symbolic form with uh, uh, seed forms that were packaged and carefully deposited under earth. In fact, the whole structure itself was deliberately buried to prevent nomadic cultures or violent cultures from destroying the magnificent monoliths. Right, and they only think they've uncovered probably like a fifth of it, and they're starting to uncover more and more. And for those who don't know... It really looks like a, a mini Stonehenge, there, but there's many of them. There are many circles, and then some of them are in just circles, and some of them are in spirals. And they're very, very heavy stones, so if you're going to do a spiral, you have to really calculate that. And then the reliefs, uh, there's actually reliefs on them where, like, the whole stone behind is cut away from the figure. It's an amazing, uh, really, technology. And they don't, they could be fields and, you know, really acres and acres and acres of this. And it seems that it shows some of the early uh, animals and plants that were on the planet. We did a film study of this, and it really pushes the envelope backwards. Perhaps the earliest temple to date uncovered of uh, human uh, history. It certainly shows great intellectual, uh, spiritual, and, well, we would call ecological skills they were all there synthesized by a very intelligent branch of the human race. And one more thing is, you know, many people think that Abraham, who's the father of all three religions of the Middle East, come from an area of Ur by the Chaldees. But actually, the uh, people that live in the area of Gobekli Tepe, and about five miles from there is the main city of Urfa, that actually they have a whole shrine to Abraham thinking that he was uh, born and raised there. So it's very interesting that this is kind of an or, which is, it means early life uh, civilization. So culture. here the Orient meets with the Near East, which meets now with new uh, archaeology and new directions of reevaluating where we are. And the, the history of intelligent life is much older than we think at the same time with evidence. Uh, and this is perhaps the seed forms of another conversation with you, on our sister planets where we believe that there are monolithic structures also would suggest that this is just one part of a vast network of intelligent life. Right, and the Keys of Enoch point to the pyramids on Mars. But I also want to say, since we're in the area of uh, Turkey and uh, such, that we also had visited the area of the Bosnian Pyramid. And, of course, it's hard to definitively say 
that this is something from, you know, 26,000 years ago because there's not a lot of uh, excavation that's been done there. But for what we're talking about, it very easily could have been a 26,000-year-old pyramid. Well, with Gobekli Tepe, too, which is I think is very important, the, the the complex itself is so large, it suggests a lot of different things. It suggests a government organization, you know, a small town or city, agriculture, obviously engineering, the ability to be artistic and and, and possibly even um, cosmological or astrological uh, information all combined into one. That civil, they, they were supposed to be hunter gatherers at this point, coming off of the last modern ice age. It just simply shouldn't exist. How many other Gobekli Tepes are there going to have to be discovered for this to be talked about on the news? And it should be, right? Front page history making news, but yet it's not discussed. Right. If you go down from uh, the Great Pyramid, with only going like maybe 30 uh, miles off, if you go down to Zimbabwe, you reach the Zimbabwe ruins. You go a little bit further down and you reach Adam's calendar and all these interesting things that Michael Tillinger is talking about, these crawls, K-R-A-L-L, these circles that are all over uh, South Africa. Those are, you're referring to 30 degrees, not 30 miles. No, no, I'm saying 30 miles if you draw a line directly straight down from the Great Pyramid all the way to South Africa and you're off just 30 miles, you will get these other artifacts. So, I mean, it's a whole grid structure that's been set up all over the planet, and that's part of what we're talking about is we feel the grids are now being activated all over the world, and people are being drawn to that and starting to understand what they really meant and why they were built. That's an interesting point. I think if you you can even... If you go from Easter Island to through Machu Picchu and, and draw a line, it will eventually go through Giza and 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 end up through Gobekli Tepe. That's a pretty. That's <laughs> right. And in terms of a vertical horizontal grid system, these are points that stand out now because we can measure them with great accuracy. And Desiree and I just returned from South Africa. We're going to be going back again because we know some of the principal investigators of unusual f- formations there in the Transvaal area and Drakensberg. And uh, these areas seem to be repositories of information from time travelers who had been here before. Right, and we worked with Credo Mutua actually since the 80s. Uh, we brought uh, many people to see him, and we have a film called Voice of Africa, and he pointed out the standing stones or these uh, uh, like Stonehenge formations. Uh, they recognize them as being healing stones. Also Although, aligned with Orion. Yeah, and he talked about also that the pe- his people came from Mars in what they call Maracaiba, which is very similar to the word of Merkaba. Uh, and he felt that after Mars had been destroyed or you know was being destroyed, they came here to this planet. Now, so uh, we're putting all those pieces together. Yeah, and one, oh, I'm sorry, JJ. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just saying that in the time that remains, I just wanted to encourage our, our long yester listeners to realize we have a whole plethora of documents, uh, films, book materials that they can get into as we build this university without walls. I think through the internet and through postings that can be done throughout the world, we can overcome, shall we say, the posture of many of the the major magazines and newspapers that don't want to take a closer look at the, 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 the greater story of civilization, what we would call Egypt's lost pyramids under the sand, or the fact that there is a musical language, of an acoustical physics, to be more specific, that links all of these great temples together throughout the world. Yeah, there's at a much earlier date than than thought. No question about it. All the way through, in my opinion, uh, Cusco, Peru, uh, Chile. Um, I, I think that there has to have been something along those lines to a form and melt these rocks and to move them and to levitate them at the same time. There, we we don't know, but I did want to ask you guys. Um, probably the number one question that comes in through callers on the show, and by the way, I've been ignoring the phone lines tonight 
everybody. I apologize for that, but I've got I've got JJ and Desiree here for the first time. I think if they come to contact, contact. if they come to your panel contact, they can talk to us along with Shock and with uh, Robert Bavell and others, and uh, get more of an in depth and perhaps see things that we can't show them on the radio program that are just electrifying in terms of what is really there. Now, what do you think uh, is going on in Antarctica? There's a lot of action going down there right now. What is it that they have discovered, and uh, what do you think is actually happening? Well, you know, we probably should save that for your show tomorrow night, because I heard you have Corey get on. I do. Corey's on this show all the time. We're not going to talk about Antarctica tomorrow. He's the main, uh, of course, person, and, of course, uh, with David Wilcox putting that out. We have not personally been there, but, of course, we have been to a lot of places. Well, I've had colleagues who've been there, for, who've lived there. In fact, in my my living room right now is a young uh, engineer, a scientist by the name of Sandra Singer, who spent 12 years on and off with American contingent down in Antarctica and uh, saw things that um, were from a little different perspective than what normally is seen through National Geographic, et cetera. I think what we'd rather say is the fact that we feel that the planet had been quite different in the past, that there probably wasn't as much snow and ice in some of these areas, and that other life forms had existed. And I think Dr. Tech also uh, was very interested in the fact that uh, probably after World War II, that some of the German technology actually this is something he's talked about for years, had actually gone there and used that as a base. And you can go under the uh, area there and, and be... Yes, I think some of my research goes probably back 40 years plus. I think it's the first uh, um, research that ties together missing pieces of history, technology, and what we would call planet, uh, parallel planetary societies um, using Mother Earth but again, this is a topic that would require hours of discussion and just wants, again, up to interest the audience. But in terms of extraterrestrials, we don't feel it's limited to Antarctica. Actually, I grew up off, uh, in Florida, and I had friends that actually had contact with extraterrestrial uh, in the Bermuda Triangle. And also, we've talked to people off of Hawaii, where there's another type of vortex energy area, and there have been many, many sightings off of Maui, for example, even back in the 60s and 70s, where you know people literally had contact with alien races that would come and go underneath the water and sometimes into some of the caverns and stuff. So, you know, I don't think you have to limit it to Antarctica. It's very interesting, of course, and it has a unique history, and we don't usually get there. And if people are, if beings are coming in, they can use the uh, the fields of the North and South Pole to enter, but they can also just come right into the oceans, as uh, George Van Tassel would say. I think people have to take a deep breath, a deep, deep breath, and realize probably the most overlooked part of uh, Mother Earth is the area of Antarctic, and that's going to speak volumes in terms of future publications and films. I, I totally agree with you, and you know what, as, as this planet tragic as it is starts to heat up and things start to melt down there uh we're going to see something pretty amazing if they haven't already discovered it already and 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 need to keep the reason why um i really feel that some of this is being suppressed it's been suppressed for so long that if it does get revealed we you and i and the rest of the planet is going to say how long have you known this and how long have you been lying to us and I think that's a big problem that uh, uh, they they really can't say much because they've been in denial for so many years. I think we can argue that those, uh, shall we say, economic elites and those uh, uh, who are in charge of information that is behind the scenes, quote unquote, you know, have their own reasons of psychology and what we would call culture shock. Right, but I think we're in a different generation now. We're in the generation of Steven Spielberg, uh, George Lucas, John Dykstra, others. I've had students that I trained who are specialists in special effects and look on the positive side of what we have. The challenges are within our own hearts. Unless we become positive and compassionate, this information simply becomes another bit of uh, abstractions that uh, fit more science fiction than physical reality people who have to survive day to day, and that is where 
positive thinking is so important here. Well, you know, what your your argument is the same as saying, you know, why haven't they told us about ETs? And here we go into how many years now since Roswell is going to be celebrated from 47 to... Yeah, 77. Yeah, se- 70 so, years. So 70 plus is now around the corner. But, but how do you but, cover uh, that up for so long? And, and then what do you tell the people? Oh, yeah, we knew about it then, but we couldn't say. But, you know, people are picking up all over the world, and really we've gone to very remote areas and people that like, you know, live in a very small country that they don't even have passports, but they have Internet, and they all know what's going on. And they're, I think they're all, the people are prepared. You know, there is contact with people, and we don't have to worry about the governments anymore. I mean, you know, push them aside in a certain sense. Let's move ahead with our own knowledge. So I think this is the greatest time in history to be alive, to see the questions of the ancients come alive answers that we thought were beyond human grasp coming into new context to a younger generation of writers, journalists, thinkers, sociologists, yes, even theologians who are working with an exotheology, a theology of the Elohim and beyond. And I think our emphasis should be not only on the next phase of evolution, but also the ultra-terrestrial, those who are behind the uh, so-called uh, extraterrestrial guardians and gods, that there is a higher supreme source that we have to look to in great humility, but also positive thinking if we're going to make it through the rough waters around the corner. And don't forget, with remote viewing, it's all thought, and we're all really entangled with one another. So if we want to contact ET, we actually can do it. If we want to contact angelic beings, we actually can do it. If we want to know about the past, present, or future, we can do it. So and- go to the highest level and see the, the divine spark and realize that the soul is doomed to perfection. I want to close, if I can, with one section from the Keys of Enoch uh, that tells us that if we look at the universe, the direct relationship between the size of the universe, the diameter of the proton, and our range of vision is part of a much larger space energy uh, transformation, which involves changes in our basic concepts of the known universe. So we are moving into a whole new experience of redefining everything. Everything is going to change in the twinkling of an eye, and we must be prepared for it as positive thinkers and guardians and pioneers of a whole new chapter of life on Mother Earth, and in a certain profound sense with the divine mothering aspect of the universe. And to pr- promote our new book, The Giza's Industrial Complex, I want to say, in addition to all the water around the Nile and underneath the pyramids and everywhere, they also recently found a cenote, or water, right underneath the Kukulkan Pyramid at Chichen Itza. I think the ancients knew a lot more about the technology than we give them credit for. They knew the water, and they knew the importance of the metaphor, the living water, which connects us. So, again, you know, our love and message of hope goes out there through you, and see you our, on dear one, our dear friend, our dear colleague. Absolutely. And listen, I cannot wait to hang out with you guys. I, I just cannot wait. It'll be a great time. Of course, we hung out a little bit at Conscious Life Expo, but here we are at uh, Contact in the Desert, and it is uh, going to be a great time. Again, thank you so much. I look forward to having you guys back on the show. But, of course, the panel uh, with you on Saturday night. Thank you so much. And for everybody, uh, there are the links for the Her Talks are over at JimmyTurchRadio.com, KeysOfEnoch.org, and FutureScience.org. They're right there. Go and click. Check out the books the videos, and all of the information there. And then we'll see you guys in a few short days right here in uh, Contact in the Desert. Thank you so much. We'll see all your audience at Contact. Great. Thanks. And, and Pax will just come peace to all of you throughout the planet in unity. We go forth. Thank you so much. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, Desiree. You guys be safe in your travels down here to Southern California. Wonderful. Good night. Great. Thank Good you night. so much. All right. Dr. JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Thank you so much. Their websites are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Just click and go. And of course, go up and say hi right here at Contact in the Desert. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. I'll be right back. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. So you went to dinner last night, you had your favorite pasta. Ugh. Or maybe you had a heavy spicy meal and it left you. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged. Ugh. Get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional. Ugh. It's all organic and non-GMO. Get rid of. Ugh. We have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one. Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Levels of power, fact or fiction. Author Mike Gilmore brings political thrillers aligned with the latest news stories direct from our nation's capital. Immigration and border security, high tension in Southeast Asia, a Supreme Court nomination. Follow Senator Randy Fisher through the halls of power as he confronts the issues that affect our everyday lives. Fast-paced political thrillers, levels of power. Discover more at michaelgilmore1.com or amazon.com. Get hooked today when you take the beans from central america with dashes of indonesian and african mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black you create the ultimate brew of fringe introducing the fade to black blend from river moon coffee yes river moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 Stereo System is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Tappy. Erica, Brittany, Gabby, and Erica. Erica. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com Welcome back. Fade to Black. Thank you, doctors. JJ and Desiree Hurtock. That was a conversation. Unbelievable. See them at Contact in the Desert. Now, I want to announce it went up in Twitter, but uh, we're going to pop it up one more time really quick. All of you fader knots that are going to Contact in the Desert, yes, we have a fader compound. Uh, a group of homes, and uh, and there's going to be a lot of action going on for the next three or four nights. So um, uh, the Fader Knots have set up uh, a little GoFundMe campaign to help pay for everything that is going on there. So if you're a Fader Knot and you're going to contact in the desert and you think you're going to hang out with Rita and I at the Fader Compound, go and throw some dosh down. Okay, go and throw it down. We'll get the links up right now. Just go and contribute because it is going to be an all-in affair. Okay, all right, us fade or not, we're family. We hang out. Let's do this together. Uh, the GoFundMe campaign is up right there. Just go. It's not much. 
just go and contribute a little bit and uh and it's a it's a good time that you are going to remember for the rest of your life i promise you that okay all right oh man what a conversation i'm waiting for uh this uh to pop up uh again one more time so i can retweet it i'll keep my eyes peeled all right all you fade or not kick it in kick it in all right there it is rita all right thank you so much boom retweet okay fade or not there you go. You're hearing me type, and you're watching me type at the same time. At least I don't do uh, one finger, right? Kick it, kick it into gear. Get it done now. That's it. Okay, there it is. Boom, it's out. You don't want to face the wrath of Jimmy. All right. And I'll tell you what. Um, we've got some really, really, really cool limited edition uh, Contact in the Desert t-shirts. How limited? We printed up 50. That's it. There are going to be hundreds of you there. So you want to get a guaranteed shirt? You want to get a guaranteed shirt? I want your name to pop up on that GoFundMe. That's <laughs> why. Okay. All right. Yeah, man. You know, like uh, like uh, my parents used to say, ain't nothing free. <laughs> All right. So everybody go and contribute and uh, and uh, let's have a good time. I mean, barbecues and drinking and food and, and good times. Uh, how about ice for the coolers? Right. OK, there it is. <laughs> go find me for the Fader House. I'll retweet it one more time. You guys are the best. I cannot wait, man. I cannot wait. All right, where am I? All right, I'll pop a few phone calls. Uh, 323-825-5045, 323-825-5045, or 323-275-9695, 323-275-9695. All right, you fader knots, kick it into gear. Make it happen. I want it done by the end of the show tonight. See, see these good times? Look at this. You see that? All right. Now, this shot right here that they just posted, that's the Joshua Tree Saloon. I remember what happened at the end of this night, all right? The tab came, and Rita picked it up, all right? <laughs> I'll never forget the way my eyes popped out of my head. There you go. How about a bonfire? Yeah, I think we did that last year. We'll do it again this year. Okay. All right. Where am I? Where am I? Check this out. I want to share a couple of things with you, and one of them is is nice and long, and it's hilarious. But check this out. For more than a year, the United Nations, the agency in Geneva, has been helping North Korea prepare an international patent application for production of sodium cyanide, a chemical used to make the nerve gas tabin which has been on a list of materials banned for shipment to that country by the United Nations Security Council since 2006. Now, does this make any sense to you? A any sense at all? The World Intellectual Property Organization, or D the WIPO, has made no mention of the application to the Security Council Committee, who's monitoring North Korea sanctions, nor to the United Nations panel of experts that reports sanctions violations to the committee. Even while concerns about North Korea's weapons of mass destruction and the willingness to use them have been on a steep upward spiral. They just killed Kim Jong, uh, Kim Fatty Fat's brother, in an airport in a public place. Think about this for a second. They are the United Nations has been assisting in this international patent application. If that doesn't bother you, I cannot explain the United Nations. I cannot explain the elite. I cannot explain the Illuminati and the cabal and the deep state and the things that go on behind the scenes. But you hear about this, and this is an official uh, press release, that this is actually going on. I, I, it, oh, man. Yeah, write that down and go and Google that, baby. That's an unbelievable story. Now.
All right. Uh, you know what? Let me do this. I want to go and uh, I want to look at something really quick. I want to do this in real time. Where is it at? Where is it at? Where? Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Keep this on. Okay. You guys are donating. All right. All right. I'm digging this. I'm digging this. Okay. So uh, we're almost there. Okay. So uh, Egyptian princess just got a shirt. I'll sign that for you. Okay. Uh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've got an anonymous here. Okay. Uh, all right. This is doing good. This is doing good. Yeah. Egyptian princess guaranteed the presence of a shirt. So there you go. Let's keep this going. You guys are impressing me. Just a little bit more to push this over the top. That's what I'm talking about right there. Okay. We need bacon. <laughs> we need bacon. I'm watching this. Okay, Rita just told me to stop. I'm not going to stop. I want you fader knots to uh to be the family that you are. Okay. Where am I? Where am I? Somebody help me. Have you heard of um uh Anatahan? Anatahan. It's an island. It's an island in the northern Mariana Islands. And it only measures 13 square miles. And what is special about this island? Well, a few things. But first and foremost, it's got an active volcano <clears throat> in the center of the island. I'm talking about a, a, a volcano that is smoking right now. It's got an active volcano. The most active volcano in the Mariana chain, right? Spanish missionaries first encountered the island in 1668. They evacuated most of the local Chamorro population and established what what the good Spaniards always do, a plantation, a plantation of coconuts. Now they started to make money off of this island. So they kick off <laughs> they kick off the original population in uh, you know by 1700 it completely liquidated that and started exporting around 125 tons of coconuts back to Spain by the end of the 19th century some things you can't make up right but listen to this but the island would be nothing out of the ordinary if not for the strange story of the queen of the uh, of the Ananahan and her 33 men. Now, what are you talking about, Jimmy? I know what you're asking me right now. Well, just listen to this. Let's, let's gather around, kids, and let Uncle Jimmy tell you a little story. The Spanish sold the plantation to the Germans in 1899, who then sold it to Japan after World War I, the Japanese revamped the plantation and sent along uh, uh, someone named Kikichihiro Higa to oversee about the 45 Shamaro workers that were left on the island. Now, Kiku then appointed a deputy overseer named Soichi Higa who became who came to the island with his 28-year-old wife just before the start of the Second World War. Now, where is this going? The war mostly passed uh, by the Anatahin, despite the fact that Americans and Japanese were still fighting and waging war all around this island. Still... Soichi Higa grew fearful for his sister, who lived on Saipan, approximately 65 nautical miles to the south. He left to find her, and he promised to return within a month, but never came back. His wife, Kazuko, soon grew lonely and married her husband's boss, Kiku, Kiku Higa. Life for the newlyweds went on uneventfully until 1944, when one June morning, three Japanese vessels were bombed by United States planes not far from the island. The vessels, well, they sunk, and 31 Japanese sailors swam safely to the island 
where they were welcomed by Kiku, the overseer, and Kazuko, the only woman on the entire island. (laughs) Now, where is this going? Oh, it gets better. The Japanese castaways settled the island and lived, you know, relatively comfortably. They lived off the local fruit, the vegetables, and the animals, and they even brewed their own coconut wine. Life was good. One of the only times that they were ever disturbed by the war was when an American B-29 bomber crashed on the island in 1945. So the settlers, everybody on the island, the 31 Japanese soldiers, they went and looted the wreck and used its materials to make pots and pans, dishware, knives, even, you know, to help build some more shelters and even clothing from the unused parachutes. Again, I'm not making this up. It kind of reminds you of what? Gilligan's Island, right? (laughs) Think about this. The Shamaro people from the neighboring islands were sent by the United States military to salvage the bodies of the B-29 crew and evacuate the remaining plantation workers in February of 1945. Now, they returned with a report. They come back to uh, the United States Army and they say, hey, check this out. There's a whole thriving Japanese camp of 32 men and one woman. When the Japanese surrendered in August of the same year, American planes flew over the island and started dropping pamphlets. And they were trying to inform the camp that the war was over. Nobody on the island bought it. They thought it was propaganda. So they held fast with, with their queen. That's right. Now, the remaining 32 Japanese (laughs) Navy soldiers, Army, that swam to the island now had their little paradise there. And they had a queen. And now they were armed with pistols that they got from the B-29. So they decided that they were going to just keep their paradise together and defend their queen. They believed, honestly, that the pamphlets and the propaganda was a trick. And they decided to stand and prepare to fight. Trouble began when uh, uh, Kikuhiga died in 1946. The war is now a year past. Kazuko, the lone woman on the island took her late husband's place as leader. Though she wasn't particularly beautiful as the sole woman in the company Kazuko became the primary object of desire and obsession. Even more so than the precious American pistols. Captain Yishida, the highest-ranking soldier, hoped to settle rivalries among his men by marrying one of them to Kazuko. (laughs) Something you just can't make up, right? Mysteriously, the new husband drowned not long after the wedding. Why? Everybody was infighting and fighting (laughs) for Kazuko, the queen. She went on to take four more husbands out of the 32. Four more. Each one successfully murdered the other in in mad, what do I want to say here? Lusty violence. Although 11 men died, one was found with, are you ready? 13 stab wounds. <laughs> As a result of one of the violent fights over Kazuko. Now, move on. Because in July of 1950, the the men determined that Kazuko was more trouble than she was worth. And they planned to assassinate her. The queen. They were going to execute their queen. One of the men secretly went behind the scenes and warned her. 
So she, (laughs) on this tiny little island, went into hiding. And she was rescued from the far side of the island. This is so Gilligan's Island, right? Because she happened to be at the right place at the right time when a, a, a U.S. Navy boat is cruising by a few days later. And she flags the boat down. They see her. Literally. Upon her return to Japan, leaving the rest of the Japanese army that was there on the island, she returns to Japan where she becomes a celebrity. She toured cities. She becomes famous. She's telling everybody about her tale of being the queen of Anatan. I'm I'm not making this up. As if her story could not grow any more bizarre or strange, when she returned to her home in Okinawa, she found her first husband. Now, remember, she just married like five guys, and and all of them killed each other over her. She returns, and she marries her husband, her original husband, six husbands ago. She married him again. Now, as time rolled on, her celebrity died down, and Kazuko kind of faded into obscurity before her death, check this, in the early 1970s. The dozen remaining Japanese soldiers held out on the island uh, uh, another year after the Queen's departure in the 50s. The United States continued to drop flyers. The guys would not surrender. They were not. They did not believe that the war was over, right? They kept saying, dude, dudes, the war ended six years ago in 1945. This did not work. The planes began to drop. They go back to Japan and they find out uh, through uh, information supplied uh, by the Japanese army, the names of the soldiers' relatives that were remaining on the island. So they go to the families, and they get letters drafted from their families begging them to surrender, that the war was actually over. So they take the letters, and they drop those over the island, literally family members begging them to surrender. Well, finally they did, and they were waving white flags on the beach to a passing ship. Are you ready? On June 30th, 1951. Unbelievable. And and, and, and there's more. There's more. I'm going to get to that in a second. But does it remind you totally of an episode of Gilligan's Island or all of the episodes of Gilligan's Island? Right. They had the entire Japanese aspect of this, too, as well. So anyway, after the Japanese left, a, a, let the small group of northern Mariana Islanders settled on the western side of Anatan, they were evacuated in 1990 after an earthquake, which led to a series of volcanic eruptions between 2003 and 2008. The island has been uninhabited ever since. Now, the story of Kazuko and her soldiers was, you know, retold in books and films, and one of them directed by uh, Joseph von Sternberg, by the way. The the crazy, lurid retellings, retellings of these tales largely paint the Queen of Ananahan as the Machiavellian temptress, manipulating men for her own entertainment. A few depict her as the helpless victim, by the way. The true story of what really happened on that island will only be known to those that were there. And that, my friends, is one of the craziest stories I can ever I can ever retell you. Now also, you know, there's the uh there's the other part of it, not quite cargo cult, but you know, these guys were cut off. They had no radios, no telephones, uh no electricity, no way to contact. They weren't able to get anything off of that B twenty nine. And uh, so, therefore, no television, nothing to connect them to the real world. And you would think, right? You would think nobody, this is the other part of the story that I find really, really strange. Why the Japanese didn't land a boat there and have some government officials on the beach telling them, you know, the truth. Maybe some newspapers dropped. Nothing happened like that. 
they kept the, they they stayed isolated and to themselves uh, until 1951. And honestly, they didn't want to leave the island. They had everything there that they needed, except well, you know, women. Is that incredible or what? It's uh, it's one of the greatest stories ever. All right, I want to leave you with a, a couple of thoughts. First off, yes, contact in the desert is this week, and one of the great things about contact in the desert is the vibe that is there not only through the researchers and the authors and the bonding and the family that is there uh, with them but it's the people that attend every type of thought and concept is there every taste and flavor of things that you want to go and research and hear is there but the other part of it is sometimes we have conflicting views Sometimes one researcher doesn't agree with another. Another contactee doesn't agree with another contactee. It, it, it's, it's that we are all in a search for the truth. And that's what's going to go down there this week. You, you get there and you cop that vibe from the word go. It's absolutely wonderful. Tomorrow night, Corey Good is going to be here. And we're going to talk about just that. Unity in the community. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. The, the, the point and the, the, the vibe of this show from the very, very beginning to today has been just that. How can we all get along? Uh, not only the researchers, but when you have uh, uh, an audience like we do here and you listen from one day to the next, uh, two different viewpoints, two different things. They just contradict each other. So you're forced to yourself to what? To make a decision? Do I do I go with yesterday's show or do I go with today's show? I'm confused. I don't know what to do with this information. Well, that's exactly the point. You need to listen to everybody. I get the question all the time, and I've had it over the last few days out there in the world uh, with uh, our friends and family and stuff, is, you know, Jimmy, what do you believe? You know, you just had this, and then you had the previous guest. You had a guest last month. You had a guest last year. They all are saying different things. So what is it? You know what? I I may have my own thoughts, but the one thing is for sure is I don't know nothing. I don't know. And the only way to get to the bottom of all of this is listen to everybody. And that's what Corey and I are going to talk about tomorrow night. All right. There's been a lot of controversy over the last three, four, five years. And that's what people know today. The, the dissension amongst the troops and amongst researchers, this goes back 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's gone on for a very long time. And our community has a way of fixing things amongst themselves. So think about that tomorrow night. My guest is Corey Good, and we are just going to have an absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of Fade to Black. Very, very special thanks to Doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Yes, they will be at Contact in the Desert this week, and so will Corey Good, who will be with us tomorrow night. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. It's really that simple. Fade to Blocks executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Special thanks to LJ3, Renee, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palman, Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster, Drew the Geek. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Corey Good. Until then, everybody be safe. Go Beckley Tappy. Tappy.